Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Bull and Rosie Wright. A very good morning to you. It is 6 o'clock on Friday the 29th of March. Good morning. You're at Talk Today on your TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are our top stories. Hard Labour, Sir Keir Starmer launched Labour's local election campaign yesterday but told struggling councils there is no magic money tree. Meanwhile, Angela Rayner insisted she has done nothing wrong over the 2015 sale of her council house. Year of Yousaf. After 12 months in charge at Holyrood, a poll finds Hamza Yousaf is less popular than Nicola Sturgeon. And Easter calm again, and with 14 million journeys over this weekend, it could be a nightmare on the roads. The intrepid Nick Ellaby will keep us updated with all the latest. And yet more heavy showers and thunderstorms to come today. A little bit of sunshine in between, but hopefully more sunshine around tomorrow and on Easter Day. I'll have more details in 20 minutes. First, though, let's get the headlines with Katie. Thank you, Rosie. Good morning. Today marks one year since journalist Evan Gershkovich was illegally detained by Russia. Evan, who works for the Wall Street Journal, was arrested while doing his job. He's been held on spying charges despite Russia producing no evidence of this. The US describes him as wrongfully jailed. Evan's colleagues here at News UK stand with him. There are also activities and rallies taking place in the coming days in support of his release. Drivers are warned to expect long delays on the roads for the Easter getaway. More than 14 million trips are expected, combined with bad weather as well. There are wind and rain warnings in place for England and Northern Ireland, with the south coast lashed by winds of up to 70 miles per hour. At least three major airports say they're expecting this to be their busiest Easter weekend on record. Well, Heathrow can expect some serious disruption in two weeks' time, with Border Force workers announcing they're going on strike. 600 officials responsible for carrying out immigration controls and passport checks will walk off the job from the 11th of April. They're angry about a new roster, which they say could lead to the loss of hundreds of jobs. Some tragic news out of South Africa. Authorities there are investigating the cause of a bus crash that killed 45 passengers last night. Only one person, an eight-year-old girl, survived after the vehicle plunged 50 metres off a bridge and burst into flames. The bus was taking pilgrims from Botswana's capital to an Easter service. And a man's been arrested for dumping more than 50 dead animals outside a community shop in Hampshire. Workers opening up the store were shocked to find the horrifying scene with around 50 dead hares, a kestrel and a barn owl outside the door. Police say a 37-year-old man is uh, facing a number of charges and remains in custody. Those are the headlines. I'll be back in about an hour's time. Thank you very much indeed, Katie. Lovely to see you, Rosie. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah. It's really nice to be here. Um, a really busy programme, this bank holiday uh, indeed. Friday. I nearly said Monday, of course, one of those is coming. And uh, quite a packed news agenda as well. Lots of things we'd really like your input on today. Um, we're going to be speaking to Annalise Dodds from the Labour Party in about an hour and a half's time. And there are lots of questions after Labour yesterday launched their local election campaigning strategy about... Angela Rayner and the status of whether she did or did not pay the appropriate amount of tax. Absolutely, and of course that rumbles on. And the question we have for you this morning, Angela Rayner, this council tax, uh, council house row, do you think all MPs should actually publish their tax returns? Let us know your thoughts on that, please, in all the usual ways. Really interesting story, and of course, as Rosie said, this is the launch of the uh, local elections. Keir Starmer taking it very much in the same vein as the launch of any general election, and of course we believe that is coming at the end of this. This year.
Let's move on now to our top story. Sir Keir Starmer said councils won't get more cash under a Labour government because there is no magic money tree. Labour's also claimed people who live in council areas under its control are better off and pay an average £276 less council tax than Conservative-run authorities. Well, we're joined now by Head of News at the News Movement, Rebecca Hudson, and Times Radio presenter, James Hanson. Really good to see both of you. Good morning. Can we, can we start? Because Keir Starmer obviously launched the local election campaigns. We know they're coming up on the 2nd of May. To me, this looked very much like a general election launch, talking about all of the years of Conservative failure, trying to put himself out there as the man who's going to lead this country going forward. These are the local elections. Mm, but I, I think we're right. I think they are... Labour are itching for an election, aren't they? You know, they've got... They, you know, they almost want to go as soon as possible because they've got this incredible lead. They just want to start campaigning and start pushing out those messages in as formal a way. I mean, and they looked like a kind of couple in love, didn't they, Andrew? Yes. Okay, yes, you know, with their kind of, sort of slightly coordinating outfits. But absolutely, you know, this is... They can start using their attack lines on a Conservative government that is taxing you more than ever, delivering you less than ever. And, you know, it's time for change and it's time for us. So I think, yeah, absolutely. It felt almost presidential almost yesterday. Mm. And it also had quite a lot of echoes of Boris Johnson, didn't it, James? Mm. And we've heard yesterday that they were sort of saying, oh, do you know, Boris Johnson was on the right thing with levelling up, but also using language like we're going to take back control. Yes. And you hear that and you think Boris Johnson. So what do you think they're, they're trying to do? What's the strategy It's there? quite mischievous politically because Labour have taken to praising former Conservative Prime Ministers. First of all, you had Rachel Reeves praising Margaret Thatcher mm. a few weeks ago. Almost saying to Conservative voters, look, if you like Thatcher, don't think you can't vote for us mm. now. Now you've got them praising Boris Johnson, saying he had the right idea on levelling up, but just failed to deliver it. The question is, if you're Labour, OK, how are you going to deliver it? And as we heard yesterday from Keir Starmer, there's going to be no extra cash for councils to actually enact policies that might level up the country. No, and of course the councils, uh, th this is a big problem. Birmingham, Nottingham, Woking effectively bankrupt, issuing these Section 114 notices. Mm. This is going to be a huge problem for Labour getting in. Also, obviously, I would say this, but taking back control is extremely mischievous. He's playing to the red wall here. Oh, 100%. He wants to try and win back those voters who previously, traditionally might have voted Labour, went to Boris Johnson and the Conservatives in 2019. But, yeah, 100%, he is trying to park his tanks on Conservative lawns and trying to win back those Red Wall voters. He's also, though, Rebecca, trying to manage expectations by <laughs> saying there's no magic money tree. Well, well, we know that, and the reality is if the Labour Party do... Uh, get in, mm. will they inherit the same financial issues that are facing the Conservatives? Mm. Well, I think that potentially they could inherit an even mm. worse economy because if the Conservatives do try to give away a few tax breaks, if they get another opportunity to do another kind of fiscal statement to the government, what Labour might inherit could be even worse. But I think you're completely right. They are back courting those red wall votes because they have got a huge challenge in how do you connect those red wall votes with the Labour Party of North London, of Keir Starmer, of Rachel Rees. There is a real disconnect there. So absolutely kind of going out, saying that we're going to improve your local services, parking their tanks on the Conservatives' lawn is, is what I think we were seeing yesterday. And, James, just in terms of the latest poll, the one for The Sun shows Labour at 45%, the Conservatives at 24%, mm. Reform at 12%. The YouGov poll puts them slightly differently, but Labour being the most trusted party now on the economy, this is extraordinary. They yeah. were the party that left a note saying there is no money left. Sometimes it's, it's important to remember how far we've come in a few years, that four years ago... After the 2019 election, people thought the Conservatives would be in power for at least another 10 years because mm. Labour went down to such a massive defeat in 2019. It has been a remarkable turnaround. Whether that's down to Labour or whether that's more down to the public being angry with the government and so therefore Labour are ahead almost by default, I mean, that's the crucial question. Mm. We're going to go through the papers shortly on the programme, but today, Rebecca, Angela Rayner's on the front page of many of them. Questions over exactly what happened when she sold her former council house... It, this all could be cleared up if Angela, Angela Rayner says, look, I had advice that says <laughs> uh, I didn't do anything wrong, but she won't show it to us. Mm. Why? Well, because, I, I mean, there, I think she is highlighting quite the double standard that we don't expect all of our MPs to publish their personal information about their capital gains tax, what tax they're paying. And those also, MPs aren't being potentially investigated potentially by But what we would also, what she would also have to disclose is what I imagine is probably some quite intimate details about her marriage, because the suggestion being that she wasn't living in the same house as mm. her husband for the first years of marriage. So there's quite a lot here that we're sort of asking Angela Rayner to disclose. Keir Starmer is saying he's seen the advice she was given, he's satisfied with it. She's saying, sure, I'll 
I'll show you mine if you show me yours. I do think, we were talking about this just earlier, that the Labour Party do have this, they don't handle politics brilliantly. And mm. I think maybe a firmer denial earlier would have stopped this becoming quite the, you know, saga mm. it's become. And, and, and James, just in terms of that, I mean, she was very much seen as a, an electoral asset because she was, she was, uh, spoke from her heart. Yeah, so great talker. She was a great talker. She wasn't kind of that, that professional politician. Is she now turning into a liability? Because this is looking murky. And I think the electorate are looking at this saying, hang on a minute, there's one rule for you lot, one rule for us. Yeah. So actually, if you bought this under a right to buy and you fiddled the rules somehow and you weren't actually living in that house, that's not fair. And she has previously called for certain Conservative politicians to be transparent with their tax affairs. So she is open to the charge of hypocrisy here. What's a bit weird is that she hasn't been more transparent. She says she's had independent tax advisors cleared her of any wrongdoing. And if that's the case, just publish that advice. Now, I understand, you know, it might be personal for her. She doesn't want to... She's on the radio yesterday saying, I don't want to go back over the last 15 years of my life publishing details about my children's birth certificates. Mm. I don't think anyone's asking yeah, for no, that. And that was made clear, actually, yeah. in the interview yesterday. Um, I think that what you're saying, Rebecca, is that it's, it's awkward for her to do this. Is it not more awkward now, the situation that she's in? It could be, it could be cleared up. She's kind of choosing mm. one of two negatives. I, I also do... I think Andrew Rayner is slightly held to different, a different standard. I think, you know, the fact is, I think she is... As you said, she was an electoral asset. She is also from a kind of atypical background in politics, a single mother, lived in a council house. You know, I think she comes up, she's come up through the ranks in a very different way. And I think she's this kind of like tall poppy. And I think any opportunity for certain quarters um, of the media, of the political class to have a go, they sort of do. And I think there are all kinds of murky tax going on, as we well know. And this could have been either a simple misunderstanding or she's done nothing wrong. And I think the fact that we're kind of pursuing her over what we're, what we're quibbling about, 1,500 quid. But I don't think that's the point. It's, a, it's about the principle. And if you're the deputy leader of any party, I think you have to be open to scrutiny. And mm. if she bought that and she lived in that house, that's one thing. But actually, if she bought that and she lived in another house, but she registered herself and she registered yeah. the children at another address, that is not acceptable. You should have good standards in public life. And politically, they are now at risk, Labour, of handling this very badly because this is rumbling on. This has been going on now for six weeks plus. And if they're not careful, this will continue to rumble on. And so, one way or another, they're going to have to shift their position on this. Um, a little bit of awkwardness for the Conservatives as well, though. Today, it must be said, um, some of the papers mentioning, you know, oh, there's always a row, isn't there, James, over honours, honours mm. list. Who gets what, when? Tell us the latest iteration of this. So, we, we've got slightly unusually an Easter mm. honours list. Mm. You tend to get a New Year's honours list and then you get the King's birthday honours. But now we have an Easter honours <laughs> list, which is in the government's gift, and they have given a knighthood to a Conservative donor named Mohammed Mansour, who gave the party £5 million mm. last year. Now, he's also given a lot of money to charity as well. They'd say he's done a lot of good for business, so it's not purely for... Uh, donations to the Conservative Party, but again, it does raise eyebrows. It, it does raise eyebrows, and when you look at the others, just, just <laughs> well, yeah. well, well, raising Rebecca. Well, I was going to say, so eyebrows. <laughs> how many eyebrows can I raise? Well, well exactly. Yeah. How many eyebrows do you have? <laughs> Mark Spencer, farming. Philip Davis, Tracy Crouch, Harriet Baldwin, jobs for the boys. Again, this is murky. It just feels wrong. Well, they would also say they've given a nighter to Christopher Nolan, the film director. Oh, Everyone loved Oppenheimer. Yeah, and why was that? Because it was seen to be a great film. <laughs> yeah. They're supporting British business. Oh, it's just chumocracy, isn't it? And also, this guy isn't a brilliant guy. You know, didn't pull out of... You know, was doing business in Russia until very, very recently. Served under Mubarak in Egypt. Like, these aren't brilliant blokes that you want backing your party, aren't they? I mean, come and clean it up. You know, you want to have a go at Angela Rayner over, you know, over 1,500 quid. You're taking <laughs> millions of pounds from some of these kind of, like, dodgy men. I mean, what? what? How, I'm trying to raise my eyebrows. <laughs> so the East, <laughs> the East on this list. So I was just going to ask, what well. does this say about the timing of the election? Well, now, that's a very interesting point, David, because there are those who say, hang on, if you're doing an Easter Honours list, does that mean that Rishi Sunak thinks this could be his last Honours list? And does that mean there could be an election June or July? For what it's worth, I think it's going to be November the 14th. But... Why? Oh. Why the Well, 14th? because, realistically, I don't think they're going to do it until That's very confident. <laughs> very confident. Yeah. It's I've, a very specific yeah, date you've given us. I think it's going to be November the 14th, maybe November the 21st, because those are the kind of middle Thursdays right. in November. I think yeah. they're going to wait as long as they can. 
I've often thought they might even go as far as January 2025, so but they I. appear to have ruled that out. Oh, but, okay. Really? Um, yeah. Gosh. James Hansen, thank you so <laughs> much. November 14th, put it in the diary. Or the 21st, depending on the 21st. Don't go on, the 21st. Don't on holiday, or do, depending <laughs> on uh, how politically maybe you're motivated. James, thank you so much. Um, Rebecca, really appreciate both of your yeah, time this thank morning. Thank you very much indeed. Let's take a look now at some of this morning's front pages. As we've been talking about in the mail, the Labour deputy, Angela Rayner, says she won't back down. She refuses for now the fourth time to publish the legal advice and tax details around the of her former council house. In the Times, Britain's biggest water supplier, Thames Water, has been told to clean up its own mess after it said bills could increase by 40% due to shareholders refusing to invest £500 million. And lastly, The Telegraph says Sunak's under fire. We've just been talking about this for handing a knighthood to a businessman who donated £5 million to the Conservative Party last year. Now, it's been a dramatic first year in charge for Hamza Youssef, with the SNP leader facing a series of political challenges since he entered a Butte House last March. What were some of the biggest events during that turbulent 12 months? Joining us to discuss this now is Sunday Times journalist John Boothman. John, a very good morning to you. Chart, if you can, sort of, well, the, the very turbulent situation that Hamza Youssef inherited and then how the 12 months since have gone. I, I think the two words that you've used so far, dramatic and turbulent, well, those are kind of pretty illustrative. Other people might say a car crash. I mean, he inv inherited a very bad situation from Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, she had been popular post-COVID, but the gloss had gone over her. Uh, a resignation was a surprise. There was a really divisive election contest, which really Hamza scraped home, scraped home in. Uh, you know, 50, I think 1% of the vote he won against Cape Four. He then, rather than hold out the hands of friendship to his opponent, who was more popular with the public, he shunned her and left her on the back benches. We then had, and look, we can't forget, uh, the big blue tent in Nicola Sturgeon's garden, the camper van, all that carry on. She was arrested, as was her husband, and then released without charge. That story still rumbles on. Uh, he spent the year reversing a lot of policies, but hasn't had any credit for it. Uh, the one big electoral test he had was a, a, a by-election at Rutherglen. Labour got 55%, knocking the SNP out in that situation. The polls are bad for the SNP. Labour biting at their heels. The approval ratings of the Scottish Government are low on just about every one of the measures. On the plus side, I suppose, he's got a council tax freeze. There were no NHS strikes in Scotland. The SNP has a big signature policy where they give £25 a week to every child under the age of 16, the Scottish child payment. But, you know, he's a guy who seems, over the course of the year, more to have been at the mercy of events rather than in control of events. So it's been a difficult year for him personally. Of course, he had those difficulties with his parents-in-law being stuck in Gaza when the war started. Thankfully, that was resolved. But, you know, it's not been a good year. Uh, the next few weeks are going to be difficult because it will be a year on from all those events that I just spoke about with Nicola Sturgeon. Um, and the election prospects for the SNP don't look particularly good either. Just in terms of that, of course, the Conservatives keen to capitalise on that and Labour as well. You mentioned Rutherglen and Hamilton West there. A 20% swing away from the SNP. The Conservatives have actually given a list of the failures under his leadership. Every A&E waiting time has been missed, rise in violent and sexual offences. In that time, they've managed to publish nine independence propaganda page, uh, pa papers costing £134,000. I think it's also worth saying that Scotland is the drug death capital of Europe. Look, it, it, you know, there has been, uh, there are all sorts of issues about focus and authority and grip round about Hamza Yusuf. Um, you know, that focus on independence when they, the public really want to focus on the cost of living and, as you say, the NHS, I think has been a, a problem for the SNP. They, they don't have a particularly big strategy in independence. They say they were elected on a mandate to do that. But do you know what? It's not where the public are at the moment. And and that's a huge, huge issue for them. Those fundamental problems that you talk about in the NHS, some of them, I think, go obviously go back to COVID, but they were there a long time before that, are just things that the SNP seems 
unable to solve. Really, they've been in power since 2007. Um, and there is a real sense, I think, amongst the public that they've just run out of ideas. And that's the problem that Hamza Yusuf has. There's a sense that they're just there, him and his ministers. They want to cling on. They want to stay there. And they don't have any particular answers uh, to take the country forward. John, if that's the case and there's been this sort of sliding in confidence from the public towards the SNP, who's sort of soaking up that public appetite instead? Well, it's, look, it's clearly the case that, and I think you have to go back to uh, that those 40-odd days when Liz Truss is in charge. After that, what happened in Scotland, rather than the SNP getting the credit uh, because of Keir Starmer and Anas Sarwar and the Labour Party, Labour really started getting the credit. If you look at the opinion polling at the moment, uh, kind of roughly equal in terms of percentages, but it looks as if Labour could win more seats in Scotland at the general election. Um, they are the party who are clearly on the way up. Um, it has to be said for the Conservatives in Scotland, despite the problems that the Conservatives have got south of the border, uh, the Conservatives have dropped in the polls in Scotland, but they could hold on to the six seats that they had. They still think they could win a couple. So at the end of the day, the SNP have set themselves a target of winning 29 seats at the general election. It's not an ambitious target, given that they won 48 the last time. Um, but it's clearly the case that Labour, who won only one seat in Scotland uh, in 2019, you know, they could end up uh, overtaking the SNP on a very, very good day. They certainly look as if they could win at least maybe 15 seats and upwards of that. And how much of this is down to his poor leadership of the SNP? How much of this is Sturgeon being an Achilles heel? And is there any kind of appetite to replace him? I think there's about both, right? Um, it's clearly the case, as I say, that the gloss had gone off Nicola Sturgeon before she's res resigned and it's got worse instead. Hamza Yusuf's approval recent ratings are actually worse than Nicola Sturgeon's than she, she left. As I say, he suffers from the fact that uh, he's really got no grip on events. Uh, he seems to lack authority. His judgment is often poor. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there, there's a problem there. Is there an appetite to replace him? Now, I think he's determined to stay, whatever the result of the election but I think it has to be said that I don't think I'd quite put it uh, in saying that, that other people are on manoeuvres, but I would be looking at Stephen Flynn, the Westminster leader, as a possible contender should uh, uh, Hamza Yusuf go. And of course, I think you can't rule out Kate Forbes, who came so close the last time. They are two very different people. Stephen Flynn, I would say, is probably regarded as being on the progressive side of the party uh, in the same type of mould politically as Nicola Sturgeon and Hamza Youssef and clearly Kate Forbes has a very very different appeal. She comes from the Highlands. She's regarded as more economically savvy than the SNP. I think she is someone who would reduce the size of government and do very very different things. But look, after the general election, um, if the SNP were to replace the leader, there'll be, perhaps if it's in October, the election, there'll only be about 18 months to the next Scottish elections and that's where you you know, we'll see whether that period in power that the SNP have had since 2007 could possibly even come to an end. We will see. John, thank you so much for analysis of what's happened over the last 12 months of Hamza Yusuf's leadership of the SNP. John Boothman there from The Sunday Times. Lots to come to still here on Talk Today. Is there another donor scandal heading Rishi Sunak's way? And Storm Nelson threatens to sink hopes of a mild Easter weekend. Yeah, former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley and writer Candice Holdsworth are here to take us through this morning's papers. Do stay with us. The time is 6.22. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna, 
And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.25. We'll have the papers for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Turning off the taps, potentially. Thames Water <laughs> may need a bailout after shareholders refuse to invest into the company, and that could mean higher bills for you. That's in the papers next. The Easter getaway is well underway, and it's expected to be a very busy one. Never fear, our correspondent Nick Ellaby is on the road with all the advice you need, and that is at 6.40. In the 4.7, we're going to discuss how the slim down royal family is getting by over the Easter period. Um, and Isabel, uh, yesterday was catastrophic in terms of the rain. It was a uh, little bit of an... It was very heavy rain, I'd say. It was <laughs> extremely heavy rain, yes. I expected Noah to sail past at one point. <laughs> um, what, what's it going to look like today? I thought yesterday was bad, uh, pretty bad. Uh, today will be a little better, a little better. Oh, and actually, I have the prospects of some sunnier skies for more of us tomorrow and Easter day. But after that, next week, I tell you, just unsettled, and particularly across the south and west, where we've got a lot of rain, a lot of water and flooding issues. Let's take a look at today's details. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, the weather's quietened down a little overnight. It's frosty with some fog patches in Northern Ireland and some parts of Northern Scotland elsewhere. Quiet before the showers develop once again today. Saturday, a little better. Some sunshine in central areas. Sunday might not be too bad for many. Still some showers in the west and southwest, though. And then as we head into next week, I tell you something, it'll feel quite chilly. There'll be some rain across the south and then weather systems queue up once again. One after another coming in from the southwest next week. Very wet indeed. Out there this morning then, the rain in eastern Scotland clears. Elsewhere, a mostly dry start, but then showers develop quite widely as we head through the latter part of the morning and into the lunchtime period. And for Scotland, well, there will be some brighter skies at times, but lots of showers for the afternoon, especially across central and southern areas. Northern Ireland catching heavy showers. Particularly northern England, the Midlands, Wales, I think, a lot of showers this afternoon. Possibly hail and thunder, tricky driving conditions. In the south, though, we could well find the showers fade to give a sunnier and slightly better end to the day. Uh, temperatures up to 12 or 13, so a little higher than yesterday. Now, through this evening and tonight, well, the showers that are sort of 
quite lively for a time, do tend to fade and run their way up into Scotland. There'll be one or two more into the western fringes of Wales and Northern Ireland. Otherwise, longer clear spells should develop through central and eastern parts of England and Wales. And I think there'll be some patchy mist and fog forming later in the night. And you might just find the odd pocket of frost in uh, the countryside. But otherwise, I think the lowest temperature is around three to five degrees. And tomorrow it starts off quite bright for many, but the shower clouds will develop in Scotland and also Northern Ireland. More central and eastern areas should get away with mostly fine weather, I think, though. During the afternoon on Saturday, there'll be heavy showers in the north of Scotland, further south, just one or two, hopefully a little more sunshine, a blustery day for Northern Ireland, yet more showers there, and a west-east split across England and Wales. Western areas best through the day with some sunshine, eastern areas rather cloudy with a little rain near the east coast. And watch out for more showers for the southwest on Easter Sunday. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Isabel. Now, writer Candice Holdsworth and former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley are here with us uh, for a look through this morning's papers. Charlie, let's start with you, if we can. Uh, this is the front page of the Daily Mail. We were talking about this earlier. This is about Angela Rayner. This won't go away for her. And the big headline this morning, Rayner on the ropes. Is she, how much trouble is she in here? Um, I think she's in uh, a lot of trouble. I mean, you're just hearing the weather there. It's raining on Rainer's parade. Um, uh, Very if good. If I can start things <laughs> off in that style. Um, not only because um, of the allegations itself, you know, um, uh, avoiding potentially uh, uh, avoiding capital gains tax, uh, potentially avoiding uh, or receiving single person's discount in one of her homes when there was an allegation that her brother was living in that property anyway, so she wasn't a single uh, person there. And obviously being registered uh, in, in terms of the electoral role in two different places and not being quite sure where she's voting. Now, the fact that she is going to potentially go on to be uh, not just Deputy Prime Minister, but uh, Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities that deals with local authorities and councils and so housing as well, she'd be responsible for the very policies of which she's being uh, accused of breaching. So it is very, very, very difficult for her, I think, at the moment. And we'll just have to see how this plays out. She will, I'm sure, at some point have to um, publish the advice that she claims that she's mm. received. Um, it can't be a tit-for-tat, as she claimed. No-one's asking for those you know, records over 15 years, as she tried to claim yesterday. They just mm. want to know what advice did she receive on this particular issue. And I think if she did publish that, the whole thing could very quickly go away. But the fact she's not doing that means that it's going to run and run. Isn't that part of the problem, Candice, that the Labour Party often sort of drag their heels a little bit or maybe slightly misread the room and then the stories balloon? Yes, yeah, well, they've just kind of wanted to put this to bed. You know, they've tried to dismiss it as a smear. She's just being smeared. But I think there's genuine questions to answer here. I mean, those living arrangements do seem unusual to a lot of people. So, I mean, that needs to be clarified. And we also, like Charlie said, we need to know what this tax advice was. I mean, she's saying, I got advice on this. It's all perfectly legitimate. OK, so what was the advice? Mm. I mean, also, Charlie, the, the great irony for me is she bought it under right to buy, which, of course, was a conservative policy. But you're right. And, and what, the, what the Daily Mail says here is she may have dodged not only the tax, but may have broken the law. That is very serious indeed. And I think they have to... And, and it's a really interesting point you made, that she's saying, oh, well, now we, we have to publish 15 years of tax returns. No, you don't actually just show us the documentation about your purchase of your house and the sale of that house it, it, exactly so and the fact that she's you know, called several times for Tory MPs to reveal their sort of uh, uh, tax requirements um, uh, that's one thing you know the fact that she's criticized right to buy exactly that Margaret Thatcher's uh, one of her cornerstone policies, which, which she sold this house under. It, it just uh, it smells of hypocrisy. It smells of... Uh, There's no criticism being... that she used the policy once it was there and it was in place. I mean, mm. I think we've kind of moved on fr from that level, haven't we? I think it's... The, the, the problems are, and Rebecca Hudson in the uh, last sort of half an hour was saying, we don't want to pry too much into someone's personal life, so how do we do that but make sure, in terms of the politics and the law, all the boxes are ticked? Well, I think you've, you've got to, in a case like this, you've just got to be upfront about it. You've either got to actually, frankly, own it, and if a mistake has been made, 
be very clear to the public, I made a mistake, I've paid the money back in some way, or I've worked mm. with HMRC to sort of tackle the problem. And by the way, um, you know, Angela, to be fair to her, you know, she is a, um, a good communicator. She, she does connect yeah. with a lot of people. Um, and she's able to do so because she's seen as relatively normal. She did have, yeah. um, she's had a, a very, very difficult, you know, uh, uh, upbringing. She's been very open about that. And I think she could actually use that to her advantage to say, look, you know, um, I was a single parent. I've got two kids. I had very different living arrangements yeah. to most families in the UK. Yeah. That was the problem. And I'm sorry I was registered maybe at two different... Um, uh, but, has she, but, but you can apologise. You but, can own the situation. Yes, that's right. But has she gone from asset, which I totally agree with, has she, Candice, gone from an asset now to, in, to a liability? Because the Labour Party is very quick to say Tory sleaze, Tory sleaze, Tory sleaze. This is looking like Labour sleaze. Well, this is the thing. That's kind of what you get a Labour politician on, is sort of hypocrisy over tax, because most Labour politicians will say Tory cuts have damaged the country, and then if they're seen in some way not to be totally honest about their tax affairs, then it's sort of reputation loss, and it's very, very hard to restore that. Let's talk about reputations. Front page of The Telegraph. Sunak, the Prime Minister, has been blasted for handing a knighthood to a businessman who, at surprise, surprise, donated £5 million to the Conservative Party plus lots of other charitable donations. We were talking about that as well. How much of a problem really is it? I'm not sure. Well, this comes on the back of the Frank Hester scandal. So, I mean, this is just another con another donor controversy for the Conservative Party, where, you know, they're seen to be taking money from people, they're rewarding them for, for things, for failure. And I think this is a surprise list. So people are saying, well, why now? Why mm. is he announcing this now when... Really, you know, the rest of the people on the on the list. It just seems like they're trying to be get, trying to give this list credibility. You know, it's um, the director of Oppenheimer, for instance, Esther and Philip Davies. It's also raising questions about the summer election. Is he trying to shore up support for a summer election? Because people are saying, why now? Why this particular timing? So why do you think now? I think that could be something quite credible. I mean, you're looking at the May second elections. What's the outcome of that going to be? If they're not very good, you could start seeing <laughs> leadership shenanigans going on. So maybe Sunak is thinking, well, perhaps I need to start considering my options here and I need to contract things a little bit. Is that, is that right, Charlie? Has Sunak reached the point of no return? So normally the honours are at New Year, the King's birthday. This is, this is aberrant in its timing. Is this... And James was just saying the election in his view, and he was very specific, November the 14th. When's the election going to happen? Or is Sunak going to do something we don't expect and call a snap election? Well, I think, um, uh, I mean, there are lots of dates that fly around. Um, uh, I thought it could be uh, October the 14th, actually, because I thought um, the, the government wanted to avoid a clash with the US election, so to get it done slightly before. And, you know, the conference season, which is end of September, early October, that could be the platform to sort of, you know, really galvanise the country and focus the minds of the public uh, during conference season to then go into an election, which could be uh, uh, mid to late October. But, you know, November's a, a date. Um, uh, there are many other dates. That's there there, there the, are the, many the, other the dates, but one of the big, <laughs> big issues for Rishi Sunak is stop the boats. It's one of those mm. five pledges. The front page of The Sun this morning, Rishi told to get tough after the poll. The polls, the latest one for The Sun, is catastrophic, I would say, for the Conservative Party. Now, they have to stop the boats, and this is all about the ECHR. And I think people watching this this morning will be thinking, I do not understand why, when we've passed a piece of legislation, the Illegal Migration Bill, what are they all still doing in this country? Well, the two things on that is the first is that um, Labour in that poll conducted by the, uh, the Sun as part of, never mind the, the ballots um, uh, that was on last night, put Labour ahead, marginally ahead in terms of trust, in terms of over the Tories when it comes to stopping the small boats. Now, that's extraordinary uh, because the Labour Party seems to have done everything and gone out of their way to block the Rwanda bill and to block migration policy. So um, you've got to question that poll versus the reality of what's happening on the ground. Um, but you're, you're right in the sense that, you know, in order to win the next election, if the Tories are going to do it, they've got to be able to deliver what they've said they're going to do. Whether you agree with Rwanda or not, you've got to see those planes mm -hmm. take off the ground. Um, in terms of the HCR, I think what people um, uh, get into a sort of sticky situation about is whether, you know, we have to leave or remain, or we have to stay in, or we have to come out of this, we have to rip that up or, 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 or write, rewrite that. What you can do is actually try and just, you know, accept that maybe the HCR was fit for... 75 years ago, it might not be for now. So we as a whole European uh, uh, um, continent, um, whether you're in the EU or not, but just as nations, have to rewrite some of these older rules to make sure that they are fit for purpose for the 21st century. 
whilst remaining uh, and adhering to our human rights laws and, and all the rest of it, all the great things that Britain has, um, uh, has achieved and demonstrated across the world. Let's look at the front page of The Guardian. Yes. Um, there is this really distressing photograph. It's children mm -hmm. um, in Gaza reaching out, desperate for, for food. And the International Court of Justice has ordered now Israel to allow food into Gaza. It's very clear that civilians are suffering, if not starving. Um, how much difference does this make, an international order like this, actually on what happens on the ground? Yeah, this is such a tricky time because, I mean, this deal has just fall, fallen apart, this temporary ceasefire deal. So Israel is sort of wondering what are, what are its options right now? I mean, it, it feels kind of that the US is backing away from it. Is it going to be able to achieve its aim of eliminating Hamas? You just look at this and you think, well, the civilians are suffering terribly. Mm -hmm. The hostages are suffering te terribly. Israel doesn't want to just let aid go into that part of Gaza because they say it could aid Hamas. That could also delay their objectives in this war. I think Hamas are just going to try and, and drag this out for as long as possible until pressure is put on the countries to come to some sort of mm. ending of this conflict. But pressure is being put on Israel now. I think the United mm. States is very clear it is changing its mind. And when you look at the vehicles queuing at the Rafa crossing trying to get in to Gaza, and you look at the faces of these children who are starving, I don't think Israel has much further to go until the international community becomes very stern with it. I think that's 100% correct. I think the international community is now starting to uh, really put pressure on, on Israel. It certainly should, because there are... Uh, in the most awful of conflicts, uh, whatever they are, you accept that there are always going to be civilian casualties. That is the price of war. That is an awful thing to happen. Mm. But uh, there are far too many civilian casualties that are now taking place in Gaza, far too many Palestinians whose lives are being lost. Um, however horrific, and it was a horrific terrorist attack that took place in Israel, we must always state that, and Hamas is a terrorist organisation, and Israel has an absolute right to defend itself and go after those people. Um, but at the same time, the international community has an absolute um, responsibility to look after innocent civilians. And when there are too many lives being lost, when that aid isn't getting into uh, the places that it needs to, and if it's being blocked by uh, Israel and the Israeli state, then of course the international community need to step in. And that's why I think David Cameron, to be fair to him, whatever you think about David Cameron, has been more vocal, I think, than, than most, even some Labour politicians, mm. to say, this is the solution, this mm. is what needs to happen. Charlie, front page of The Times and other papers this morning, The Express as well, are talking about what's happening at Thames Water. The Express go, disgrace, fat cat water bosses underwater. We're learning that customers of Thames Water may have a significantly increased bill because they haven't got enough money. Well, you're, you're again absolutely right. I mean, we were talking a second ago that, you know, about Rishi Sunak needing to get tough on some of these policies. It's absolutely the case the government needs to get tough on Thames Water and these water companies where there are billions of pounds of uh, bonuses being paid to people uh, and uh, the money hasn't been invested into the infrastructure. It hasn't been invested uh, into Thames Water. It hasn't delivered for customers. Uh, and now that they're coming cap in hand, it seems at some point asking for um, a, a huge bailout you know, with potential uh, bill rises of 40 percent for consumers. That is a disgrace. Um, and this has been going on for years. And I know my old boss, Michael Gove, was on the airwaves, I think, earlier on today to make that exact point. The water companies need to absolutely get a grip of this. They can't pass it on to the consumer. Mm. Uh, they need to find a way of, of funding that, uh, that black hole. But, but they made enormous profits, these water companies, something like £14 billion, and they got fined £114 million. Thames Water has debts of £15 billion. Isn't the problem here that, whilst I agree with privatisation of many industries, how do you privatise water when you really only have... Well, you only have one supply. You can't choose, oh, I think I'll have a different water well, that's the question. Has privatisation failed? Because there is no real competition. And this, we're seeing this pattern again and again and again, where private equity moves into certain areas, racks up lots of debt, the costs go up massively. I mean, we've seen this in the pet industry now. And it's often in these areas where people don't feel they have a loss of choice. You know, if your pet is ill, you're just going to pay whatever you need to pay. Same with water. I mean, you don't really have a choice. You have to consume water. So this is becoming a real problem now. I don't think we should be ideological about these things. If privatisation hasn't worked, it hasn't worked. And if we need to look at other options, then that's what we need to do. Mm. Charlie, Candice, thank you both so much. They're going to join us again in just under an hour to go through some more of the stories inside the papers. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Now, as you know, the Easter getaway is predicted to be busier than ever this weekend with more than 
18.5 million car journeys estimated to take place. Well, Q, huge traffic jams along with bustling airports and train stations. Oh, we're hearing the word Carmageddon. <laughs> we certainly are. Well, talk today's correspondent, Nick Ellaby, has hit the road, and I'm delighted to say we can cross to him now. A very good morning to you, Nick. Where are you uh, this morning? Yeah, morning, David. Morning, Rosie. Happy Easter as well. I'm actually just at the top of the M3, where it connects with the M25, one of the big areas to avoid today. It's actually looking all right at the moment, um, but certainly later on this morning, journey time from the M25 along the M3 down to the south coast as people get away for the Easter break are expected to double. It usually takes about an hour to get down to Southampton. Uh, from the, off the M25 could take two hours, maybe three later on. And those peak times, sort of late morning into the afternoon, few places to avoid. Certainly the whole western stretch of the M25 from Gatwick in the south, heading down the M23, right up to the M1 in the north of Hertfordshire. And that's because you've got few airports there. Gatwick at the top, Luton at the, uh, sorry, Gatwick at the bottom, Luton at the top. A uh, number of airports expecting their busiest Easter ever as we've got this bank holiday, the first bank holiday of the year, colliding with a, the start of the two-week school holidays as well. So lots of people trying to get away. We've, we've we met people this morning heading to Heathrow as well. So certainly this section of the M25 is one to avoid. And then another one as well, the M5 down to the West Country. Seems like a lot of people escaping to the southwest. Bristol down to Taunton, the M5 is supposed to be particularly bad at sort of lunchtime into the afternoon. And then you've got the A303 as well, but that's supposed to be bad coming back on Monday. So try and avoid the A303 on Monday. And then in the north, you've got the roads uh, around the Lake District, always bad, but again, all through the weekend. Today, Good Friday, could be a very bad Friday for people on the roads, uh, you know, as people try and, try and get away. We've spoken to a few people who are trying to beat the traffic, heading down to the southwest early. Um, that's a pretty good idea. If you can, grab your kids and get going because it could get pretty leery later on. And then in terms of the, the trains and the ferries, uh, the whole of the West Coast main line is having works on it this weekend. And it's actually most of it is shut. So from London out to Milton Keynes is completely closed. That's affecting people trying to get to Manchester in the northwest. And then on the ferries, Huge queues expected today at Dover, and you've got those extra security checks as well on the French side. So massive, massive queues expected at the port of Dover as well. So the advice really, as well as checking your oil, your tyre pressure and your fuel to make sure you don't come a cropper or break down anywhere, is just to try and leave early, try and you know, leave a bit more time for those journeys. And then today we're going to try and get down to the West Country for you, see if we can get closer to the, uh, the M5 over to Bristol trying to chat to some people at the service stations, find out what their plans are. And I'll also see if I can eat a whole Easter egg in one go as well. It is Good Friday after all, guys. I'm sure you'll do a great job at that. Uh, the last task, uh, Nick, and as you say, Nick will be keeping us up to date. Would you recommend on... that, actually, with your medical well, hat on, David? Uh, look, uh, to be honest, the, the nanny state has gone far too far. I don't really mind if you have one Easter egg on one day. That's absolutely fine. But it's about long-term planning, making sure you have a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> OK, we'll find oh, out a little bit more it's fine. from Nick uh, a little bit later. Still to come here on the programme. Kensington Palace has confirmed that the Princess of Wales and her three children will not attend the Easter service. But which royals can we expect to see this weekend? It's Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.49 now with the tragic news of both the King and the Princess of Wales' cancer diagnoses. They've taken a step back from royal duties at the recommendation of their doctors. Well, there are 11 working royals. That includes uh, the King and the Princess of Wales. But members of the public are wondering which royals are still on duty. We are joined now by royal commentator Michael Cole. Michael, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Talk us through, this is normally, you know, a big event in the royal calendar as well, the Easter weekend, all the way from uh, Monday, Thursday, right the way through till Monday. What kind of shape is it going to take this year in terms of the royal family's involvement? Mm. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, David, on, on Good Friday. Yes, there has been a thinning of the royal ranks uh, in recent days, but there will be a, a goodly muster of the uh, family at St George's Chapel, Windsor, on Sunday. The king is determined to be there. It means a lot to him. He is a man of faith, um, and Easter is arguably a more significant, a more important date in the Christian calendar, even than Christmas. Uh, and he's determined to be there, and the queen will be there with him. Um, he finds great faith uh, in, in Christianity and its Anglican expression, which is just as well as he's head of the Church of England and defender of the faith and all of that stuff. As you say, uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales will not be here. They're up in the part of the country where I am at the moment. They're up at Anne Hall, their rather elegant um, country house on the uh, Sandringham Estate, which I think is more or less uh, their home. There we see the King and the Queen, I think that's at Westminster Abbey on a, on another on another ecclesiastical occasion. Of course, what is a bit of a problem because in the absence of the Waleses and the absence of the Sussexes and their children, uh, the ranking royal in the royal pecking order is Prince Andrew. Uh, he's eighth in line of the throne, and I'm sure that there's no force on earth that will stop him uh, being front and center on uh, on Sunday, which is not going to be to everybody's liking. There we see him in happier days at the lectern, uh, and he will be there. Uh, of course, his sister, uh, Princess Anne, uh, will be there probably with her children, or at least uh, her, her uh, uh, Princess Zara Phillips uh, and her children. So there will be a good turnout, but it won't be like in days of old. Also, the king was very keen to have a slimmed down monarchy. As Rosie said right at the beginning, there are now 11 working royals. When you look at those working royals, when you look at the Duke of Kent, for example, Princess Alexandra, they're not in the first flush of youth, are they? 
I've, I'm afraid Edward Kent, the Duke of Kent, is really getting quite feeble. And Alexandra, who did so much for the royal family, was always so elegant and pleasant. She's now in a wheelchair. There we see her in happier days. And she a really charming person. No, they're not av available. Of course, uh, Princess Anne, who's always trenchant in her comments, in an interview with Canadian television before the coronation, uh, she spoke about her brother's uh, wish for a slimmed down monarchy. And she said, well, that was made in days when there was more of us, she said. But, you know, that's my brother. You won't change him. Um, of course, what the, what the king was trying to do before events overtook him was to emulate what his grandfather, King George VI, said. And King George VI said that the royal family was always best when it was just us four, by which he meant himself, Queen Elizabeth, who later became the Queen Mother, and the two princesses, uh, Elizabeth and Margaret. But it, it's not possible these days. The role of the royal family has changed. They've been very much more involved on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with all sorts of organizations and functions throughout the country. So. It is looking a little bit threadbare, but um, the king is determined that the show goes on. And I think, uh, I think Rosie and I think, David, there'll be a good turnout uh, at Windsor uh, to wish him well and express their loyalty uh, and good wishes. You've said the king's determined. We've also been hearing that he's quite frustrated at sort of the pace of his recovery. I mean, personally, how do you think he'll be feeling? You know, words like talking about that the working world's looking threadbare um, won't sit well with him. No, he, he really wants to get back. And I think part of that photograph, that official photograph that was released with his uh, audio message to the Maundy service was to show him at his desk there recording, uh, you know, the King's speech, uh, echoes of that with his grandfather, George mm. II, of course. No, he wants to be back. And of course, he's still completely uh, active doing his role as head of state. Uh, having a, the, the prime minister has an audience of him, to use the official expression, every Tuesday, and he's getting through the, the papers. What he's not doing is interacting with the public uh, as much as he did. And of course, that's sensible because when you're undergoing chemotherapy, which I think he is, mm. uh, it's best to avoid all sorts of infections or any possible sources of infections from wherever they come. So he's becoming isolated. But I know he, he really wants to get there and he wants to show that he's uh, on the ball uh, and, and, and doing his stuff. Very important. It's very, very sad for him because the first full year of his reign was a great success with two state visits to Germany and then France and a visit to Kenya, as well as the coronation. And it was all going so well. And to have these uh, double blow, uh, his beloved uh, daughter-in-law, uh, Kate, as he always calls her, uh, and himself with cancer, couldn't have been worse. But we can all only do at this Easter time of rebirth, renaissance, is to wish them uh, well uh, and speedy and complete recovery. Of course, we absolutely, absolutely echo that here. Michael, thank you so much. Michael Cole. There is lots more still to come here on Talk today. There is no magic money tree. That's the warning that Sir Keir Starmer's issued to struggling councils ahead of the general election and the local elections <laughs> in May. We'll bring you everything you need to know next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Oh, it's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Bourne and Rosie Wright. And a very good morning. It is 7 o'clock on Friday the 29th of March. Yo, we talk today on TV, radio, online and, of course, on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Well, Sir Keir Starmer's launched Labour's local election campaign, but told struggling councils there's no magic money tree. Well, meanwhile, the deputy leader, Angela Rayner, insisted she's done nothing wrong over the sale of her council house in 2015. A year of Yousaf. After 12 months in charge at Holyrood, a poll finds Hamza Yousaf less popular than Nicola Sturgeon. And Leicester City, Leicester City women sack their manager over allegations he was in a relationship with a player. Sam Ellard will reveal all later this hour. Heavy showers and thunderstorms again today, but hopefully tomorrow and Easter day should be a little drier for more of us with some sunshine, and it should feel just a little bit warmer as well. Super, thank you very much indeed, Isabel. Uh, the uh, Angela Rayner story won't go away, so the front page of the Daily Mail this morning, Rayner on the ropes, we're asking, should all MPs be required to publish their tax returns? Let us know your thoughts on that. Email us, talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talktv. Also, you can text the word talk and your message to 8722. So let's get the headlines now with Katie. Thank you. A very good morning. Journalist Evan Gershkovich's family has renewed calls for his release one year since he was illegally detained by Russia. Evan, who works for the Wall Street Journal, was detained while doing his job. He's being held on spying charges, despite Russia producing no evidence of this. The US describes him as wrongfully jailed. Evan's colleagues here at News UK stand with him. And his sister, Danielle, told reporters her family remains hopeful he'll be home soon. I'm sure you can imagine this has been a really difficult year for our family, but out of standing here at one year, um, I've been reflecting a lot, and um, um, it's, it's incredible to see this community of journalists rally around Evan. We're so, so grateful, and um, uh, there's the international community as well. Drivers are warned to expect long delays on the roads for the Easter getaway. More than 40 million trips are expected combined with bad weather. There are wind and rain warnings in place for England and Northern Ireland, with the south coast lashed by winds of up to 70 miles per hour. At least three major airports say they're expecting this to be their busiest Easter weekend on record. 
Well, Heathrow can expect some serious disruption in two weeks' time when border force workers announcing they're going on strike. 600 officials responsible for carrying out immigration controls and passport checks will walk off the job from the 11th of April. Well, they're angry about a new roster, which they say could lead to the loss of hundreds of jobs. Some tragic news out of South Africa. Authorities there are investigating the cause of a bus crash that killed 45 passengers last night. Only one person, an eight-year-old girl, survived after the vehicle plunged 50 metres off a bridge and burst into flames. The bus was taking pilgrims from Botswana's capital to an Easter service. And a man's been arrested for dumping more than 50 dead animals outside a community shop in Hampshire. Workers opening up the shop were shocked to find the horrifying scene with around 50 dead hares, a kestrel and a barn owl outside the door. Police say a 37-year-old man is facing a number of charges and remains in custody. Those are the headlines. I'll be back in about an hour's time. Super, thank you very much indeed. Lots of you getting in touch with that, uh, that uh, question I asked about whether we should uh, make sure that MPs publish their tax returns. Sarah says they should all be forced to publish every last single detail of their expenses claims. Every single discrepancy should be an on-the-spot gross misconduct, instant dismissal offence. And Elton says they are public servants. They absolutely should be transparent with their financial dealings. Let us know if you agree. You can text the programme 8722 just start your message with the word talk or you can email us as well talk today at talk.tv yeah let's move on to our top story now Sir Keir Starmer has said councils won't get more cash under a Labour government because there's no magic money tree well Labour's also claiming that people who live in council areas under its control are better off we'll look at those details in a bit more detail uh, they say you'll pay an average of £276 less council tax than under a Conservative run authority. Well, we're joined now by Times Radio presenter James Hansen and former Labour Party official Richard Power. Saeed, very good to see both of you. Thank you for good coming morning. back, James. Richard, really good to see you as well. Now, Keir Starmer has kicked this off. These are the local elections. Anyone would think, watching him and his speech, this was the beginning of the general election. Oh, yes, you would think that, <laughs> you wouldn't would. you? Yeah. Oh, isn't that funny? Um... I mean, this is sadly what happens with local election campaigns, right? They just become proxies for what's happening nationally. And in this case, you know, we're expecting Starmer to be prime minister in less than a year. So in a way, that's quite reasonable. The country needs to see as much as they can of him and be able to challenge him, hold him to account. That's the right thing. So, James, what have we actually learnt then about the Labour Party's plans for local elections? Mm. They're saying you can trust us with the economy, you'll be better off, but then saying there's no magic money tree and they're going to need money if they want to, as all of the public wants, improve public services. Well, this is it. And they're talking about levelling up. Remember that, Boris Johnson's big phrase. But they haven't said how they're going to pay for it. What does levelling up actually mean in practice? What policies need to be implemented and how do you fund it? And Keir Starmer, using, as you say, David, that phrase is no magic money tree. Where have we heard that before? Mm. So basically saying we want to level up by giving more power to local councils. But by the way, there's no cash to do it with. And just on this thing about Labour, people in Labour council areas pay less council tax, I'm a bit sceptical about that. Isn't that because often in a Tory area you might have more expensive properties, so the tax bands are a bit higher, and so on average, the, the council tax bills are a bit higher. That's yes. probably all that's going on there. And it's it? about the banding. So I would throw back <laughs> at you Tower Hamlets, for example, which is where Canary Wharf is. The council tax is off the scale, and that's Luther Rahman who runs that, a Labour controlled council. Yeah, so I'm a little bit sceptical about those figures. Luther Rahman isn't Labour uh, sorry. anymore. He, um, oh, he, def he, he, he defected. He defected before the last election, so. But the point um, I'm trying no. to make is the same one, mm. which is actually when you have really expensive properties, the council has. House uh, council tax tends to be more expensive. Yeah. Richard, I can see you nodding along with that. <laughs> James's uh, apt analysis of exactly what's going on. Why does the Labour Party need these sort of like cheap PR strategies then to try and persuade people around? Because you might look at that and think, OK, so the Labour Party are trying to tell me that under the Conservatives you're paying more and getting less. Are Labour sort of saying, well, you'll pay less and get even less with us? You know what? I'm not particularly keen on the magic money tree phrase. I think it kind mm. of gives a, a false impression of how government finances work. 
But I actually think the credit to Labour, credit to Keir Starmer, he's being pretty frank about what the situation is and what kind of expectations... Managing expectations, have. Yeah. Managing, It's managing expectations, which is the sort of pragmatic version of it, but the other version of it is kind of not giving people false hope about what government can achieve, particularly in a very difficult geostrategic position, which is what Britain now is in. What I would say is, you know, to this question of how are they going to pay for it, very reasonable question, the answer that you had from Rachel Reeves last week in this big speech that she gave was, we're going to find basically cheap, inexpensive ways of doing it. So, for instance, you've got um, uh, housing planning uh, rules. They're going to say to councils, if you don't come up with a plan for getting private developers to build more housing because of all your NIMBYs, then we're going to force it on you. That is free. That's free for the government and it's free even for local authorities f to do. Similarly, um, going to the social care sector and saying, you are going to have to put up wages for, for care workers. We're going to give them the power to organise together, go to bosses and say, you've got to put wages up. It's free, but it helps people. These are very clever ways for the I government... Think wages isn't free. Sorry, it's, it's, it's free for the government in terms of government spending, mm. right? So um, the government uh, is able to really improve people's lives, to level up um, uh, in a way which doesn't actually cost the taxpayer. James, well, you might be thinking that is magic. Mm. Well, yeah, but I mean, if it were that <laughs> easy, the government would be doing it already. No, they know? wouldn't, because they don't want to uh, make well, no, so bosses' so, lives difficult. But, but, but James's point sector. is valid, which is the Conservatives said they want to build 300,000 new homes every But they don't year. do it. No, they don't do it, because you're met by opposition locally. Now, if Labour goes in and railroads those local communities, they won't be very popular for very long. So the short answer to that is those are places that probably aren't going to vote Labour at any point and therefore they're not so concerned about it. Before we get into the weeds of exactly the, 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 the challenges currently facing the deputy leader of the Labour Party, James, mm. can you? It is complicated. Yes. This is all about where she lived, <laughs> when and when she sold her house. Tell us. Are of, you giving me the, the challenge of trying uh, to explain? I am. <laughs> <laughs> but just surface level, there are yes. allegations about where she sold her home and where exactly. she lived and what tax she paid on it at the time. So this is about the council house in Stockport that Angela Rayner, deputy leader of the Labour Party, used to live in when she sold it. She didn't pay any capital gains tax on it because she claimed it was her primary residence. But there are allegations that actually she was living with her then husband instead. And so if it wasn't her primary residence, she would have been liable to pay capital gains tax on it, which she hasn't. Now, she says she's had independent tax advice that is clear to her in all this and says she's done nothing wrong. But a lot of people are now saying, well, OK, fine. If you've done nothing wrong, publish your independent tax advice and then we can all see and then this row can go away. But it's rumbling on. And there are big questions now over, well, why hasn't she been more transparent if she says she's in the clear? Can I just say, excellent explanation. Yes, Thank it was extremely much. good. So, given that, Richard, it, all of this goes away, all of the speculation. If she just says, I've had that advice, as James said, here it is. Why hasn't she done that? You know what? She has. She's gone to the police and she's given them all that information and they've said, totally fine, don't worry but about it. But they've reinvested, reopening the case. So this is the very clever thing. Going to kind of like pull the curtains back here, do the like comms person explanation of what's going on. When you don't have new evidence in a case like this, you just get some local MP to... Uh, mouth off to the police about the fact that they think that the investigation should be reopened. The police know that they don't have any new evidence, know that nothing's going to come of it, but they open the investigation well, you, you again know, in order you to do, please that person. You don't know person. what information the police have. Yes. The police have said no, they I need no, to no, review it. No, we do, because the police have said we don't have any new evidence. We are reopening this because we have been... Um, a, a Tory vice chairman has said you should reopen it, so we're going to look at it again. But, They're not even investigating. But it's the They're optics. just deciding mm. whether to... Richard, yeah, it's sure. the optics of oh, it, the optics isn't it? In, in terms of the electorate, they see pigs with their noses in the trough, and here we go again, and we're met all the time by Labour saying, Tory sleaze, Tory sleaze. This is looking like Labour sleaze, and it is front page. It would be in the mail, but it is front page. Um, Angela no, Rayner, is she going from an electoral that. asset into a liability? In 2007 when she was working as a care worker for the council, she bought her council home. And I think most people will not begrudge her that. No. And most people will look at that and say, God, But that's irrelevant. More. Did no, wait, she wait, wait, break the say, law? Most people will say, 
that is exactly the kind of person that we need in politics. Now, Angela Rayner herself, I agree, is a Marmite character. I love her. Some people don't. I think the fact that people really dislike a working class woman who's really, really improved her life and fights incredibly hard for other working class people, being deputy leader of the Labour Party is an amazing thing. And I think that's disingenuous, actually. I don't think that's what people think, James. But, I mean, if you pose as a straight talker, which in many ways Angela Rayner is, then you've got to back it up. And when people ask questions she has, about... She's gone she has previously called for Conservative candidates to publish, for example, their tax returns. Yeah. She has asked that of other politicians. She's, she is being totally transparent about the financial elements. What she is keeping private, and I think this is very reasonable, is anything that relates to family members. And it is really grim, I think, when people start no, publishing she registered, family members... She registered the births of her children like at a different address. This is now in the public interest, And I don't it? think anyone is asking for her children's birth certificate. She, she made this claim oh, on the radio Michael yesterday. Michael Ashcroft is. She, she said, oh, you know, I don't want to have to unearth 15 years' worth of personal documents. No one's asking for that. People are just saying, wouldn't it make the row go away if she published the independent tax advice that she said she had recently that cleared her of any wrongdoing? If the financial crime experts at the cops and HMRC say that it's fine, good enough for me. Richard, tell me hand <laughs> on heart, if we were talking about the current deputy prime minister, mm. would you lay out exactly the same case? Oh, that is a good question. I'm going <laughs> to challenge myself here. I think if the cops and HMRC said it's totally fine, I'd be OK with that. OK. James, the problem with these mm. stories is they can stick. You know, from your yes. experience mm. charting these political stories, how much of a problem actually is this? Is this a small blip for Labour or is this something that could escalate? Well, it's a sign of what the Conservatives want to do. I mean, they're loving this, the Conservative central office, because they know that if they do somehow miraculously win the next election, it won't be because of some groundswell of enthusiasm from the current <laughs> government. It'll be because of negative stories about Labour and chipping away at the public's faith in Keir Starmer and the team around him, people like Angela Rayner. Mm. Thank Good you night. both very much for time. <laughs> We're going to actually... Annalise Dodds from the Labour Party is going to mm. be on the programme in the next half an hour so we can put some of these questions to her. James Hanson, thank you. Thank you. Richard Power Saeed, uh, former Labour Party official. Really appreciate both of your analysis this morning. N let's now uh, take a look at some of this morning's front pages. And as you've been hearing in the mail, uh, Labour Deputy Angela Rayner says she won't back down. She refuses uh, for the fourth time to publish the legal advice and tax details around the sale of her former council house. In the Times, Britain's biggest water supplier, Thames Water, has been told to clean its own mess after it said bills could increase by 40% due to shareholders refusing to invest £500 million pounds and lastly, The Telegraph says Sunak is under fire for handing a knighthood to a businessman who donated £5 million to the Conservative Party last year. Now, it's been something of a dramatic first year in charge for Hamza Yousaf, with the SNP leader facing a series of political challenges since he first entered Butte House last March. What were some of the biggest events during Yousaf's fairly turbulent first 12 months in office. Joining us now to discuss this is Shadow Health Secretary for Scotland, Dr Sandish Ghislaine, alongside the author of the book, SNP Leaders, Jerry Hassan. Jerry, let's start with you. Um, in your expertise charting the kind of rise and falls of previous leaders of the SNP, mm. how, have, how have the last 12 months gone? Um, not, not very well, really, for whom's use of first, first point is he survived as leader. Uh, and second point is he's kept the, the show on the road of, of the SNP broadly as a coherent uh, political party. But the achievements are small. He is, in many ways, like Rishi Sunak, a, a fag-end Charlie leader. The SNP have been in office 17 years. That comes with problems. There's issues of party governance as challenges, um, a police investigation, um, the project of independence. Is on 50% roughly support, but there's no there's no traction towards it in progress, and there's been no serious work done on it. So it's it's a very very mixed picture, mixed bag, and they're expecting bad election results uh, coming up in um, in the forthcoming Westminster election against Labour. Sandesh, um, the Conservatives have actually published a, a list of 100 policy areas where Hamza Youssef has fallen short. It's also worth saying, under his watch, Rutherglen and Hamilton West saw a 20% swing uh, to Labour. So j just talk us through your, your views of uh, his record in office. Well, look, it, it, it's been an unmitigated failure. Uh, in the last past year. And look, I'm not sure, come the 1st of April, whether that statement is going to become a hate crime or not. Uh, and it, we've got 119 different instances over the failures that Humza Yusuf had as becoming leader. And essentially, he's so obsessed with independence 
that he's forgotten that the day job is very important, that looking after the NHS, which Scotland is completely devolved, uh, needs to be done, looking after our, our teachers, looking after education standard, all of that has completely failed and fallen by the wayside as long as he talks about independence, for which he's published nine papers at an eye-watering cost of £150,000. I mean, it, it would be ridiculous, though, Jerry, wouldn't it, if, if the leader of the SNP wasn't pushing for independence? I mean, that's his job. That, that, that's right. I mean, it, it, th this is the defence of the SNP at the moment in government, and it's not a great defence, which is to say, look at the terrible state of Westminster. Uh, our, our mess is not as bad as that. Now, that is true, but it, it ain't the place to start. Um, it, it's a bit rich for Tories criticising the SNP. Obviously, it's what they do, and exactly about, um, it's true about what you make the point about independence. In, but independence, those papers don't address the fundamental big strategic questions independence has to, which is about the economic prospectus, which is about uh, how we run our public services, about how we do stuff in a society that is more ageing um, than the UK. And Humza Yousaf doesn't have the political capital in the SNP or the country or the cut through or the presence to make those big um, choices. And he, he, unlike Sunak, at least he was elected in an open leadership election, but he only won it narrowly, 52-48 against Kate Forbes. And she's sitting at the back benches waiting to make her move when in the forthcoming Westminster elections, uh, the SNP will face reverses, as you said, versus Labour. And uh, whatever the result is in Scotland, in Westminster, it's going to feel to everyone like a Labour victory, because if the parties end up neck and neck, Labour could win 20, 25 seats in Scotland. They may not win as many as the SNP, but it'll feel like a Labour victory compared to, you know, the, the SNP kind of uh, dominance we have at the moment. Uh, and Sandesh, let me ask you, what's the view from the electorate in Scotland? When you look at the health service, for example, as you mentioned earlier, fully devolved, when you look at that, every single A&E waiting time has been missed. A third of people are not seen within that four-hour period that you're meant to be seen in. You've seen a rise in violent and sexual offences. You've also seen drug deaths uh, at an all-time high. It's the, it's the drug death capital of Europe. You're absolutely right. If you look at some of the staggering misses that we've had, 820,000 patients are on a waiting list in Scotland. Only 72% of cancer victims start treatment within 62 days. And we've seen a record rise in our crimes, 185,000 crimes recorded with a rise in violent and sexual offences. Now, look, up and down the country, I'm knocking on doors and I'm speaking to people and they're frankly fed up with the obsession of independence, which comes over doing the most basic things. But Sandesh, they're uh, not... They're we not, are looking Sandesh, at running... Sandesh, they're not voting for you, though, are they? Well, we are going to see an increase in the number of Scottish uh, Conservatives that are elected at the next general election. Up and down the country, we are narrowly number two in multiple seats from East Renfrewshire uh, all the way across uh, our borders. And that is where we are the number one challenger. And we are going to be taking... SNP seats uh, across a number of places in Scotland. As Jerry was talking about there, the, the story may be of a Labour victory, not an SNP one and, and potentially not a, a Conservative one. For now, we have to leave it there. Sandesh and Jerry, thank you both very much. Still to come here on the programme on Talk Today, will the BBC's financial problems lead to a rethink on how the corporation is funded? And could, get ready, <laughs> ahead of Easter Sunday, could a daily dose of chocolate be good for your health? Mm, former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley and writer Candice Holdsworth are here to look through this morning's papers. This is Talk Today, the time, 7.20. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge 
Quite right too. Okay. Quite okay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It's 23 minutes past seven. Now, we'll have the papers for you in just a moment, but first, let's give you a bit of a glimpse of what else is coming up in the programme. Well, a daily dose of chocolate is good for your health. Yes, that's according to a new study. That's in the papers next. Um, but what about eggs? How free are our free-range eggs? After eight o'clock, we're going to look into an investigation claiming that chicken welfare isn't going far enough on some farms. And a mounting problem. Before nine, we'll be joined by someone who has climbed the world's highest peaks to discuss if Everest is becoming overloaded with tourists. First, though, let's get a glimpse on the weather. Isabel is here. Isabel, it's going to be a fairly gloomy Easter weekend. I know, it's really annoying. It's a bit better, thankfully, <laughs> for tomorrow and Easter's day. I mean, not perfect, but better. And then next week again, it's just unbelievably unsettled. It's really annoying because there's been such a lot of rain and the southwest looks worst hit. But let's take a look at today. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. We had all sorts of problems on the roads and rail yesterday because of the heavy showers and thunderstorms, gusty winds as well. Showers to come again today, Good Friday. It's a little better for many central and eastern areas tomorrow and actually on Easter Day, but there's still low pressure close by, so still some heavy showers around. And then into next week, we see low pressure systems coming in from the southwest to bring yet more unsettled weather. And it really does look as though the west and south will be worst affected. It's been so wet in the last few months and yet more rain to come. Out there today, well, chilly start in places, particularly in Northern Ireland, Northern Scotland, some fog. Otherwise, showers get going again, heavy with hail and thunder. Some sunshine in between, though. For Scotland, I should think the afternoon fares quite well in the north, but uh, Central Belt and the south will see some heavy showers, Northern Ireland catching heavy showers. Across England and Wales, some showers too, quite widespread through this afternoon. Again, some problems if you're travelling, real downpours, deluges in a short space of time. But I'm quite hopeful that for East Anglia and more South eastern areas it should end up being quite nice the showers fading to leave a sunnier end of the day not too bad temperature wise the showers tonight will tend to gradually ease their way up into scotland there'll be a few coming up towards the south and west but many places will become dry overnight some mist and fog possible particularly across central and eastern areas of england and wales and there's just a chance of the odd pocket of frost most places though seeing temperatures nearer around the three to five celsius range the breeze easing off a little and in fact that's one good thing because tomorrow not as windy so in any sunshine it will feel a little bit more spring like temperatures climbing into the low to mid teens maybe some rain just clipping the far east of east 
Anglia in the southeast with a veil of cloud there. Otherwise, it is a showery day, but the showers tomorrow look as though they'll be mostly focused across Scotland. A bit of hit and miss, but some showers there. Rather a blustery day tomorrow for Northern Ireland with showers, but for western parts of England and Wales, not bad. Sunny for the most part, just the odd shower. Cloudier, as I said, further east. But there will be more heavy showers to come for the southwest in particular on Saturday night and Sunday. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Isabel, thank you very much. Now, we're going to go through the papers uh, in just a moment. But first, uh, the Labour Party today is uh, trying to tell you that Labour authorities charge less council tax than their Conservative counterparts. But Sir Keir Starmer says there is no magic money tree for councils. Let's find out a little bit more of the detail. We're joined by the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds. Annalise, a very good morning to you. Can you... Can you help us sort of square this circle? Um, we're being told there's no magic money tree for local councils, but that you're going to level them up. So how are you going to do that? Good morning. Well, it's really important that we do deal with that awful situation we're seeing in local authorities. Over the last 14 years, we've seen really the economic decline that's impacted every part of our country, also impacting on local authorities and you know what you said about council tax at the beginning is absolutely right on average if you take the figures for this year if you live in a labor run area then you're paying 276 pounds less than if you live in an area that's controlled by another party so there's clearly far better financial management coming from labor run councils but we've not seen from national government the approach that's needed. First of all, actually, national government hasn't made sure that money that was announced to much trumpeting from levelling up, that it's actually got into projects on the ground. 90% of that money hasn't actually been spent on projects. But also we've had a really short term approach coming from central government, year on year chop and change in the financial settlements for local government. So Labour would be working really from the ground up, rebuilding councils from the ground up so they can have much more stability so that those local communities can be taking back control and having much more control over their destiny. A few things I want to kind of pick up on there, Annalise. The first is that uh, council tax is predominantly determined by the, the value of the house that you live in. That's got nothing to do with which authority uh, is in charge. It could be, um, it may very well be, that Labour-run councils have properties in them that are less valuable. Well, actually, if you look, for example, at Band D properties, on average, if you live in a Labour-run area, then you're paying £38 less. So this isn't something that just shakes down into what kind of properties are in different areas. There's clearly that strong financial management coming from Labour because ultimately Labour as a party recognise the money that people have got in their pocket is really important, particularly now when we've seen so much pressure on family finances because of that cost of living crisis. We're really determined to make sure that people have as much of that money still in their pocket as possible. Annalise, people want better public services. That's the key thing. We've seen that in many YouGov uh, polls. And I, I wonder, you want to talk about specific examples. Residents in Birmingham, their council tax is going up. This is a Labour-run authority going up 21% and yet they're being told the streetlights are going to be dimmed, your rubbish isn't going to be as collected as often as usual. I mean, that, that's been shameful management. Well, I was in Thurrock yesterday and actually we see a similar increase in council tax taking place. And that isn't a Labour run authority. I mean, the big change that we've seen over the years is, as I said, coming from central government, that really short term approach to local authorities, not letting them know what finance they'll have in the future. And as a result of that and other changes that the Conservatives have made, unfortunately, you've seen huge pressure on different local authorities. And as I said, that's not just impacted Labour-run local authorities. You know, there's a, a special mechanism uh, that's applied if you have a local authority that's in really difficult financial circumstances. You used to hardly ever hear of that section uh, 14 notice being applied in the past. Well, we've had so many different cases of that section being applied under recent Conservative-led governments, and that's because of their mismanagement of the situation, both with local authorities, but with public services more generally. 
I think in, in Thurrock, the council tax is going up by about 10%. In Birmingham, it's 21 So if we, if we really want to make these comparisons, uh, we can. Um, Let's, let's talk about... We're going to go through the papers in just a moment. Unfortunately for the Labour Party, it's negative headlines over uh, your colleague, Angela Rayner. And the lack of clarity, really, the questions which all could be answered, and I wonder if you sort of agree with this, Annalise, that could be cleared up if she just issues the advice that she said she had, which says she didn't make any mistakes. She's followed uh, the letter of the law. Do you think it's right that she says to the public, I can clear this all up, I'll, I'll show it to you? Look, Angela um, is someone who always does the right thing. I know that. I know her very well. I've got complete confidence in her. And, you know, really, I think we need to ask the question, why are we seeing this petty politicking coming from the Conservatives? You know, I know that rather than talking about the finances of one individual, many people watching this will be saying, well, hang on, why aren't politicians talking about family finances, talking about the finances of the country, you know, yet again, as I said, more petty politicking coming from the Conservatives. I think a lot of people are pretty fed up with this. Annalise, was it petty when Angela Rayner said of Nadim Zahawi, for example, if he's lied and misled the public and HMRC regarding his tax affairs, then I think his position is untenable? Well, no, of course it wasn't. And we were talking there about a situation where the very person who was running those overall services hadn't actually been clear about whether they'd adopted an approach that was very different to that taken by millions of taxpayers in our country. Look, I've got every confidence in Angela Rayner. And as I say, I think we need to ask the question of why the Conservatives seem to be obsessed with petty politicking uh, around Angela Rayner rather than actually focusing on the big issues for people on the ground, the cost of living, our public services that are crumbling, they should be talking about their plans in those areas. And I know why they're not, because they haven't got those robust plans. But, but Angela Rayner's brief, if elected, will be housing. Why leave room for the speculation? Why not just clear this up? She could be uh, the Deputy Prime Minister in charge of this brief where the allegations lie. This all could be cleared up. Do you regret maybe that the policy wasn't different uh, a few days ago and this could have been, you know, cleared straight away? Well, you know, I think there's something very important here, and it's the fact that we have a politician who was living in a council house, who decided to purchase their council house. And that's quite unusual to have a politician to do that. And I don't think that's a problem with Angela Rayner. I think that's a problem with our political system, that we don't have enough people who've got that experience of everyday life. We should have more of them Quite frankly, we should have more people who've got that everyday experience. And as I say, I think this petty politicking that we're seeing from the Conservatives is really because they don't want to be talking about the cost of living. They don't want to be talking about our schools, our hospitals, the lack of police on our streets. And that's where the national conversation is. Annalise Dodds, thank you for your time at the Labour Party chair speaking to us this morning. Let's move on to this morning's papers. Writer Candice Holdsworth and former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley are here uh, for the papers. Uh, let me just start, Charlie, uh, by asking you, Annalise Dodds there in that interview, uh, your face was a picture. What did you think of what she said? <laughs> Um, well, look, I'll try to be as objective as I can, but the idea that, you know, it is just conservative, uh, uh, petty politicking, I think she used uh, several times, that line just simply won't hold throughout the day for the exact question and the reason that Rosie was putting to Tanley is that this is a woman that could be uh, the next housing secretary, the woman that should be looking after councils and electoral reform, the two allegations that are put to Angela Rayner that she is um, allegedly broken. And just on what Annalise was saying, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a politician buying their own council house. I absolutely agree with that, Elise, actually. That is a good thing. You know, it's good to have people from all kinds of walks of life and to be able to understand what it's like to buy a council house. It's not about buying the council house, it's the sale of the council house and the way in which it was sold, the allegation of not paying uh, capital gains tax on that house. That is the issue. And I think that it was so fundamentally ignored by Annalise there means that I'm afraid the Labour Party will have to come back with a better line, and I'm sure they will, hopefully. Well, we'll sake, see how the day afternoon. develops. As we know, <laughs> these things can change. Uh, let's turn our attention back to the papers now. And, Candice, uh, in the mirror, this, this video we're going to show you, I must just warn you... Um, could be quite distressing, um, so just bear that in mind as we play it to you. This is um, someone's now been arrested, a teenager, um, after someone was stabbed on a commuter train in London. I mean, the video is really shocking. It's kind of shocking that someone was just watching, but obviously it was a, a frightening thing to, to have encountered. And, and 
really awful um, that this happened, you know, obviously broad daylight. Um, what do you make of this, Candice? I think this is just horrifying. The, the images are absolutely horrifying. I mean, the person filming it felt maybe that was the only thing they could do. They couldn't intervene, so they filmed it. And thank goodness they did, because it probably played into the fact that the teenager who committed this has now been arrested. Um, this, on suspicion. On suspicion know, of, yeah. of, of, of attempted murder, yes. Um, so this, I mean, this comes amid a, a big rise in knife crime among, amongst mm. teenagers. And, you know, what we're seeing is that London is unique amongst all the other British cities for seeing a rise. And Sadiq Khan and the Home Office and the policing minister are sort of fighting over the reasons for this. You know, Sadiq Khan is saying there's been huge cuts to the Met, this is why. They're saying, no, your strategy is all wrong. But of course, for the public, they just want this to be sorted out because anyone who was on that train that day and many people watching it, they're going to feel much less safe in well, public well, space. Well, I, have to, I have to say the police did a very good job. The British Transport Police were there quickly. Obviously, uh, then that suspect has been arrested, Charlie. But I think Candace makes a really good point here about the rise in knife crime and the brazen way that young people are carrying knives in full public view. Mm. Uh, it's an outrage, um, and you know, it, uh, you know the police. You're absolutely right. You know, were able to intervene in that particular situation. I feel terrible for the commuters that were mm -hmm. also in that video that were just clearly shocked that they, were, you know, felt as if they had to sort of remain rigid in their seats. Obviously, you couldn't you know normally you would try and uh, run away. But I don't think this is a necessarily a policing problem or a met problem. It is uh, individuals who carry knives or people that buy knives online. Uh, at, at those online companies that allow people, 16 year olds, some even mm -hmm. fact, I think as, as young as 11. Uh, that are able to buy these machetes, these zombie knives, they need to be totally taken off the streets. Mm. But the perpetrators that carry those knives, such as that individual, uh, needs to face the punishment, needs to face uh, jail time, if it is the case that he is uh, convicted, and, and send a signal to anyone that wants to carry a knife, anybody that wants to try and use a knife in the way that we've just seen in that horrific video, they will feel mm. the full force of the law. Well said. Uh, this week, we've been talking a lot about China. And uh, we were talking at the very beginning of the week at this hack they'd taken out on the Electoral Commission, data about 40 million uh, voters. They'd been messaging uh, MPs and trying to sort of seep into Parliament. And yet now we learn, Charlie, front page of the Times today, um, security concerns have been raised over a multi-million pound deal for a Chinese company to supply a supercomputer to an arm's length government body in Britain. Does that make sense to you, that decision? <laughs> um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and I don't think it would make sense to uh, to many people across the country. But you're right, it is a uh, uh, an arm's length body, the um, uh, Science and Technology Facility Council, as part of the UK Research and Innovation Group, um, who will be buying this um, uh, uh, part of a computer, which enables access for better technology. It enables private companies like Unilever and Rolls-Royce to uh, gain information, to trade information. But the idea that it is being supplied by a Chinese company, a Chinese firm, that would have access to such data, including at nuclear uh, and atomic sort of uh, uh, um, uh, information, I think will be hugely alarming. And it comes at such a terrible time because, as you say, Rosie, it was on the back of Oliver Dowd and the Deputy Prime Minister only uh, earlier this week. I think it was, you know, uh, outlining and naming Chinese officials for uh, um, interfering in our political process, because that's what it is when you try and gain access mm -hmm. to our electoral role. And when you are uh, at, at cross party, you know, there were three MPs, you know, there was Tim Loughton, there was uh, uh, Ian Duncan Smith uh, and uh, Stuart McDonald, the SNP MP, all have been targeted by China. Uh, and, you know, credit to Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, for trying to call it out and take more of a robust line against China. But it seems uh, counterintuitive to the current state of affairs to give them another contract that involves them being involved in our national infrastructure. It seems no lessons are ever learned to me. Uh, let, Candice, let's move on, if we can, and talk about this story in the Daily Mail, a really interesting one, actually. Yes. Drug hope for women with the Jolie breast cancer gene. This is the BRCA gene. Yes. Uh, the BRCA1 gene. These are women who are at high risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer. So uh, just talk us through this story. So this is fascinating to me and so personal as well, because I know so many women who have that BRCA gene and they've discovered it because their mother developed yeah. breast cancer. So, I mean, you go through this very traumatic thing as well. Mo the treatment mostly for most women that I know is having a preventative mastectomy. So, I mean, that's the removal of both breasts, which is a huge thing to go through. You have to go through psychological counselling as mm. well, not to mention the fact if you haven't had children, you won't be able to breastfeed them. It's a huge, huge, huge thing for women. But they na they're now thinking they might be able to develop a drug that you take instead that can help the immune system fight the tumours. 
So that's incredible. And this is the rise of immunotherapy. We're starting to see this being rolled out across all disease modalities. And this is really such a brilliant piece of news. And as you rightly say, it's all of those things. When you have your breast removed, the, the removal of your femininity, for example, as well. And, 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 you, and it sort of completely changes the way you feel about yourself. It does. It does. I mean, everyone I know has had to go through it. They've got, they, they go through it because they know they have such a high chance of developing breast cancer. But the psychological fallout, we know it. We know, we know what it is. You know, losing that part of your body, it, it, can, it can lead to depression. It, it, mm. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a brutal method, whereas this is something a lot less invasive. And I just, I think it's fantastic because it's right. one of the most common form of cancers. So, yeah. We're going through the papers this uh, bank, long extended bank holiday weekend. Lots of us, I'm sure, will be eating some chocolate at some point. Uh, Charlie, front page of the star. Oh, sorry, page four. Um, Boffin say we should scoff chocolate every day to boost not just our hearts, but also our mental health too. Well, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep up with all this uh, medical yeah. news. Wine every day, chocolate every day, none of it. Exercise 30 minutes a day. It, it, exactly. And it comes um, uh, after just comments earlier this week where um, another doctor was saying, you know, don't eat a whole uh, Easter egg because, you know... Um, Not uh, this one. No, I, I said, look, it's OK. You know, totally. it's, it's one off. And actually, Nigel Farage, he pushed back, didn't he? He said, I'm going to eat a whole egg, if not more than one. No, exactly. Well, I, well should we all be taking health advice from Nigel Farage? <laughs> well, maybe not. He drinks maybe. quite a lot as well. <laughs> but, it might not be the best I couldn't idea. possibly comment <laughs> on his <laughs> drinking habits. But, um, but I'll certainly be having a, a, a chocolate bar or two. But it also, there was also another story today about um, eating fish as well. So if you eat, um, everybody eats uh, fish on Good Friday, but if you eat two portions of fish a week, it can save the NHS about £600 million pounds because of the, the health boost. And this goes and back to a much bigger issue. Probably here, not if you then eat an Easter egg every day as well. No. <laughs> and, and just in terms of this story, I was going to say mm. this is about patient responsibility and working in tandem with the NHS and not expecting, expecting the NHS to pick you up when you are sick. You need to actually put in the hard jars yourself. Just in terms of this story, the chocolate, does it say, what kind of chocolate you need to eat? Uh, it, it says dark chocolate may also reduce blood pressure. Um, uh, but also it says that the, just any chocolate is good for your uh, mental state because of the sugar and, you, <laughs> and, and uh, cocoa and things that's in it. It does boost you. It gives you a lift. I mean, I like a chocolate bar. In fact, I got through half a bar of fruit and nut last night. So there you are. <laughs> <laughs> An exclusive for you. <laughs> I don't know. All this generalised health advice, I don't know. I'm not sure about it. Mm. And Everyone's different. Everyone metabolises sugar differently. This is something I learned myself having gestational diabetes I was told so diabetes brought on by pregnancy yes, yes I was told avoid potatoes avoid fruit don't eat any of those things mm. guess what when I measure my blood sugar after having it no change whatsoever you know what they say Charlie a little bit of what you fancy does you good I'm sure, I'm sure it does. Yes. Fruit and nut included. Fruit and nut included. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave. And also, your, your bar of fruit and nut maybe get much more expensive. We were talking earlier yes. this week, the cost of chocolate mm. is, is astronomical now, actually. Per ton, mm. cocoa mm. is more expensive than copper. So and that's, that's why, why you're so seeing uh, mm. more expensive Easter eggs as well, or, or smaller mm. sizes. Yeah. Um, Charlie Rowley, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Candice Holdsworth, they'll be back with us uh, in just under an hour. Lots of you getting in touch this morning with your views, particularly about what we were just hearing from Annalise Dodds about her perspective. She says, absolutely not. Angela Rayner shouldn't have to publish the details of her tax affairs. We've been asking you if you think that's right. Yeah, we have. Ricky says they should publish everything, not be made to do so. A requirement when elected. Now, Alfie, I don't know how I feel about this. Not only should our politicians public their, publish their tax returns, they should be forensically audited every year, including five years before entering office, ten years after leaving office. Office. I'll tell you what, no-one would go into politics if that was the Well, case. that would be an extremely long administrative process <laughs> well, as well. It would cost a lot of money. Um, keep your views coming in. You can text us, 8722. Just start your message with the word talk. You can email as well, Talk today at talk.tv. There is lots to come here, because after the break, we're going to be joined by Talk Sport presenter Sam Ellard with the very latest in sport. Sam, what's happening? Yes, plenty more coming up. Uh, Leicester City women's manager Willie Kirk, he's been stacked over an alleged relationship with a player on the team. Meanwhile, Newcastle, Sandro Tonali charged again with breaking, this time the FA's betting rules, placing 50 bets on matches in just three months and a massive game on Sunday. Man City will host Arsenal in what many people think is a defining match in the title race. This is Talk Today. A very good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed absolutely. to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It's coming up to 10 minutes to 8. Now, Leicester City have sacked manager Willie Kirk following an investigation into an allegation he had a relationship with a player. Now, the club said he was determined to have breached the team's code of conduct to a degree that makes his position now untenable. Well, here to tell us uh, all the very latest is TalkSport presenter Sam Ellard. Sam... Uh, I'm sorry, I should just say, he wasn't determined to break the code no, of conduct. He, they it had they been determined, determined that him. he had. I wondered that when I you said it. He woke up every morning thinking, how can I break this code <laughs> of conduct? No, exactly. Today's going to be the day so, I'm going to do this. So, 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 Sam, just talk us through this. So, the club has said he breached the team's code of conduct so that his position is now... Untenable. untenable. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the second kind of big case just this season we've had of, in the women's game, a manager mm. being a male, having a relationship with obviously a player who's, who's a female. Jonathan Morgan um, was sacked as the, the Sheffield United manager um, in this season for, for, a similar, for a similar situation. Um, and I think this is kind of opens up, I think, guys, to a, to a wider debate. And I'll actually get your thoughts on this because obviously... It's not, it's, not, it's not a footballing issue, but these are kind of two big high-profile cases of male manager and a female player. Mm. But I believe, and I think we're learning a bit more now over the last couple of months, that in the women's game in general, there are a lot of people that are in relationships. And also as well, women, on, the, the, the ladies in the same team going out with each other, I think quite a lot, maybe more than we, than we think. And it kind of opens up to a, to a bigger debate that should that be allowed? Should any of this be allowed? Um, what does the Code of Conduct say? The no relationships. The, yeah, the, the, the code of conduct is, is no relationship. Mm. But I think what people also want, Rosie, all, on that... Even between what, team so, members. So, no, certainly from, I believe, the hierarchy yes. and, and, and players because, in the because team. Because that would be seen as an abuse of power. Yeah, and I think... But what I think people also want... You asked that question. I think people want a clearer message in all of this. Because I think some of it... Mm. Is a, people are a little bit unsure on exactly what, what, what's required and what, what is allowed and what isn't allowed. But if I was to throw you this question... Because some people will say, you know, it's two people in a work environment... 
who spend a lot of time together are consenting adults. And some people say, if a man and a woman, OK, he might be the manager, she might be, I don't know, a player, you're completely saying no, I'm absolutely saying not. No, OK, because, that's fair enough. Well, that, well, only because I don't think it's a level playing field then, literally, sure. a level playing field, is it? Because, of course, then you have that hierarchical difference between sure. the two. You can understand why these relationships develop. Of course, you're Spend working together, together closely right? in yeah. high-stress yeah. uh, environments. Travelling together. Um, yeah, so we'll see how we'll see how that develops. Yeah, they will get any more clarity. Yeah, should we move on to the FA charged Newcastle, um, Newcastle's Tonali over these betting rules? This was a clear breach. Yes, yeah, so Sandro Tonali um, mm. moved from Italy to Newcastle in the summer. It was a big, big transfer, and very early on into his time as a Newcastle player, he was banned for for ten months. That was by the Italian Football Federation in October for breaking the betting rules in Italy. And as we thought, we were coming towards the end of that. Now the FA alleges that Tonali broke its rules by placing 50 bets on matches between the 12th of August and the 12th of October. So that's during his time in the Premier League. I think it's the Sun this morning that report that he betted. Some of those bets were on Newcastle matches, which is, of course, the wow. team that he that he plays in. Um, again, we'll have to wait and see how this plays out. But if, if he's found guilty, I mean, you know, he's already got 10 months for doing it in Italy, now comes to England. Um, mm -hmm. It's obviously going to be, you'd imagine, another big, big ban. The first thing I sort of, you know hear or think when I see this. And this is a guy that has got, you think, the world at his feet. He's living out, I think, most um, mm. boys. Teenagers boys dreams, are, a teenager yeah. dream. He's a professional footballer. Yeah. And I would have given anything to be a professional footballer. You almost just think that having a bet, it just it wouldn't come into your mind. But clearly it's, it's an addiction, right? It could be an illness. Mm. And you kind of almost hope that it's a lot of bets that he kind of gets the, the, the help that I'm sure he needs. I know Newcastle have been mm. very supportive. But yeah, in Italy... Now we believe as well, certainly the accusations anyway, are that whilst during mm. his time here in England, he's done some bets as well. Wow. Uh, let's talk about the Tottenham versus Nottingham Forest uh, being moved. This is in the Premier League. Uh, because uh, they've done this at a very short notice, haven't they? And fans yeah. not very happy no. about it. And so tell us what's happened. So the game simply was supposed to be played on, on Monday, um, the Monday night game, but there's now going to be some, some train strikes on that game. Um, so they moved the game forward to a Sunday 6pm kickoff. And again, I think with football fans, guys, this is part of a bigger problem 100%. where essentially football fans are, I mean, right to the bottom of the pile. When fixtures get released for TV, and sure, you know, the, the Premier League can probably argue that, you know, football clubs get paid big, big money for TV rights and, and that pays for, for players and everything. But it's cliche, but football without fans is nothing. You know, these are the people that spend their hard-earned money to go to games of football. And week in, week out, there is no consideration at all for fans. Mm. Late changes. Um, so often, you know, if, if it, it, quite often you'll see a, a game in a weekend, mm. right? Where let's say Newcastle all the way up there are playing Brighton all the way down in the south, right? They'll put that game at late at night on a Monday night, for argument's yes, sake. Can you think if, yeah. if, if that's the furthest way? Why put that on a Monday night when Newcastle fans, for argument's sake, have got to make the long journey down? They've got to take a day off work on Monday, a day off work on Tuesday. And I just think that too often football fans are being... They're, they're the afterthought. And they, they're the ones that spend their money. But also here, it's Easter. So this is about the bank holiday. So people looking forward to that bank holiday game. And then they've moved it to Easter Sunday, yeah. where people already have plans. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a shambles. It's a shambles. It's happened, it's happened for years, though. This, this is nothing new, Rosie. Of course. Should we talk about a game lots of people are looking forward to? Are you to? looking forward to it? Man City v Arsenal. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> is on Sunday. Yes. I said lots of people will be looking okay. forward to it. Are you not going to watch it? On Easter Sunday, no, I think I'm, I've what, already got my plans. What are you doing <laughs> on Sunday at 4.30? I have interest. I'm really intrigued to know what's best I'll than Man City Arsenal. I'll probably be digesting a lovely Easter Sunday lunch. Whilst watching Man City Arsenal. <laughs> How about that? There are other residents of my household who might quite like to watch it. Um, tell us, what can we expect? Um... You can expect one of the best games of the season. One point separates the three teams at the top, Man City, Arsenal and Liverpool. You've got two of the best teams in world football, two of the best coaches. Um, Arsenal this season, I think they've got a little bit. Last season, they kind of fell away. Um, this got you yawning, really. I'm not looking forward to the game, <laughs> are you? Um, it's quite simply, you've got the best players, the best team. We're entering now, back for the international break, that final crunch of the season. Nine big games. Not often do one point separate three teams. Sit back, cup of tea. Mm. It's going to be a special game of football. Right. You weren't yawning. Oh, I'm, so, I'm not going to be watching. I'm not going to be watching. Uh, do we have time to talk about the heavyweight uh, title fight? Fabio Wardley defending his British and his Commonwealth heavyweight titles against Fraser Clark this Sunday, both on beach and it's live on TalkSport that Sunday night. It's going to be a belter. Nicely done. Thank you very Sam, much, Sam. Thank you so much. There is lots more still to come here on Talk Today.
no magic money tree. That's the warning that Sir Keir Starmer issued to struggling councils ahead of the general and local elections this May. That will bring you everything you need to know next. Uh, this is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Rosie Wright. A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Friday, the 29th of March. Good morning. You're with Talk Today. We're on your TV, your radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are our top stories this morning. Hard Labour. Sir Keir Starmer launched Labour's local election campaign yesterday, but told struggling councils there's no magic money tree. Meanwhile, Angela Rayner insisted she has done nothing wrong over the 2015 sale of her council house. Now, how free is free range? An investigation claims that chicken welfare isn't going far enough on some farms. And a mounting problem, as tourists are accused of blotting Everest landscape. We'll get the view of one of Britain's most accomplished mountaineers. Heavy showers and thunderstorms again today, but thankfully the next couple of days look a little drier for more of us. Hopefully a bit more sunshine around and it will feel a little warmer too. Lovely stuff. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. lovely stuff, Isabel. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but should we get the headlines with Katie? Why not? Thank you. A very good morning. The family of journalist Evan Gurkovich has renewed calls for his release one year after he was illegally detained by Russia. 
Evan, who works for the Wall Street Journal, was detained while doing his job. He's being held on spying charges, despite Russia producing no evidence of this. The US describes him as wrongfully jailed. Evan's colleagues here at News UK stand with him. Activities and rallies are taking place in the coming days in support of his release. Angela Rayner's colleagues are rallying around her amid a tax row over the sale of her council house. Well, the deputy Labour leader says she's confident she hasn't broken any rules. Party chair Annalise Dodds told Talk Today Angela Rayner always does the right thing. I've got complete confidence in her. And, you know, really, I think we need to ask the question, why are we seeing this petty politicking coming from the Conservatives? You know, I know that rather than talking about the finances of one individual, many people watching this will be saying, well, hang on, why aren't politicians talking about family finances? Drivers are being warned to expect long delays on the roads for the Easter getaway. More than 14 million trips are expected, combined with bad weather. There are wind and rain warnings in place for England and Northern Ireland, with the south coast lashed by winds of up to 70 miles per hour. At least three major airports say they're expecting this to be their busiest Easter weekend on record. An eight-year-old girl is the sole survivor of a bus crash in South Africa, which claimed 45 lives. Authorities are investigating what caused the vehicle to plunge 50 metres off a bridge and burst into flames. It was taking pilgrims from Botswana's capital to an Easter service. Finally, we're not expected to see Kate Middleton this Easter while she's being treated for cancer. But King Charles is expected to make an appearance at Windsor Castle's Easter Sunday service. Royal commentator Michael Cole told Talk Today it's hugely important to him. It means a lot to him. He is a man of faith um, and Easter is arguably a more significant and more important date in the Christian calendar even than Christmas. Uh, and he's determined to be there and the Queen will be there with him. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update at nine o'clock. Super, thank you very much. Uh, let's move now to our top story. Sir Keir Starmer said that councils won't get more cash under a Labour government because there is no magic money tree. Well, Labour's also claimed that people who live in council areas under its control are better off and pay an average of £276 less council tax than Conservative-run authorities. Now, we did take a little bit of issue with that uh, and spoke earlier to Annalise Dodds, uh, the Labour Party chair, about exactly how they came to some of those uh, figures. And obviously one of the big things uh, facing the Labour Party now are the, the kind of questions about why Angela Rayner isn't issuing, making public all the information about her tax affairs, Indeed. which might clear up exactly what happened uh, when she sold uh, her home. It's made the front page of the Daily Mail this morning. Rainer on the ropes is the headline. Well, to talk about uh, this and all the latest political news, we're joined now by Anna Mikhailova, who is the political editor of The Mail on Sunday. Really good to see you. So, so right at the beginning, uh, this is Keir Starmer launching the local election campaigns on May the 2nd. But you would be forgiven for thinking this really is the beginning of the general election. He talked about uh, 13 years of Tory failure, of economic decline... And, and it's really fascinating when you look at the polls, how Labour is shifting its position where the public seem to be trusting Labour more on economic matters than the current Conservative government. That is really an anathema when you look back at recent political history. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's Labour very much parking their tanks on the Conservatives' lawn. Uh, you had this poll by The Sun yesterday, which says exactly that. To be honest, polling that we've done, you know, um, for pretty much all the papers have done for the past few months now have all shown exactly that as well. Labour being trusted more on the economy. I think it's partly down to people being, well, number one, very frustrated um, and wanting a change is, is increasingly, I think, coming up in, in focus groups. But also... Any government, frankly, would be hammered by the current economic situation mm. that Rishi Sunak mm. has inherited. Mm. What was quite interesting yesterday, listening to Keir Starmer, he is borrowing an awful lot from former prime ministers, whether that's <laughs> Boris Johnson's idea on levelling up, using slogans like taking back control... What do you kind of think the strategy is here? It's very... I mean, the taking back control was the particularly curious one, considering uh, Keir Starmer's previous position on Brexit. I think it shows he's getting quite co confident, quite comfortable... Um, and even 
referencing things that previously he would have really shied away from, mm. which was his record on second referendum, Brexit and, and Remain. Um, so he does not see that as something that hampers his uh, political chances by quite distinctly referencing taking back control, which is obviously a, a, a Brexit logo. Um, and, and then, of course, on levelling up, well, I mean, look, lots of sensible people will say, yes, we need more levelling up, absolutely. There are very, very few people in whether public policy or, or, or within Whitehall who are Or just the population, it, who wouldn't think that makes the sense. Yeah. Um, the the key, key question is, how do you do it? And, and, and of course, Keir Starmer's saying, we want levelling up, and he pray, controversially praising Boris Johnson uh, um, uh, yeah. for the policy, and yet saying there's no magic money tree. But, yes, you can have devolution. Um, it is a sort of policy that he can pretty much announce. One of the very few things he can announce without having to to put some money behind it, which is probably why they went for it yesterday. Yeah. Um, but equally, I think to do it properly, you do need money. You, you need proper funding of schools, you need proper funding of um, uh, local services. Well, so. well, that's right. And of course, I'm minded of the letter that was left saying there is no money left mm. in the Treasury at the end of the last Labour administration. Taking back control, I find particularly fascinating as a Brexiteer and someone who fought for that. When we look at the polls, we actually do have that poll uh, from The Sun showing the voting intention. If you look there, Labour now 45%, Conservatives at 24%, Reform UK at 12%, and Lib Dems at 10%, and the Greens at 3 uh, Also, when you look, there is another poll as well from the YouGov. That shows slightly different results. But there is also a, a real shift going on there in terms of the, the Conservatives hemorrhaging votes to other parties. Well, to reform. Um, and that's increasingly making Conservative MPs, for example, very, very nervous. And um, you are getting murmurs of, why can't you just make a deal? Surely there's some way of making a deal with Richard Tyson, Nigel Farage. But there would be no deal. So the deal was done where the Conservatives got an 80-seat majority. They mm. squandered that. There's no way there would be a deal. Look, I am of the view that in politics, you can always make a deal with people. There's you just have to find whatever um, <laughs> whatever they want, uh, and, and, and sometimes that might be a painful option. But, look, um, it, it certainly looks like there is no political will to make a deal. Mm. I think that is accurate. Mm. I think that is an accurate read of the current um, number 10. But if, 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 if the polls are to be believed, and they probably are, you're just going to see so many votes from Conservatives, particularly in the red wall seats, hemorrhaging to reform. Yeah. In the meantime, for the Labour Party, it feels like all they've got to do is hold still, not slip up, not make a mistake. Mm -hmm. this, this latest story about Angela mm -hmm. Rayner, where she was living specifically, what tax she did or shouldn't have paid when she sold uh, her former council home, how much do these stories stick and do they actually cause harm to the wider party? I mean, I think what really sticks is the perception of politicians not being quite straight with people. I don't actually think people are that bothered by 15 years ago the actual details of the the, the um, uh, housing arrangement and the tax arrangement. Even if she were to sort of, if there was something that had gone on, if she were straight away to have said, "Right, sorry, made a mistake. Um, uh, you mm. know, I was. Mm. These were my circumstances." I think the public, if that was the case, I'm not saying it is because we do, we just don't know because all these questions are unanswered. But had that been the case, I think people would say, "Right, move on." I think it's what actually sticks is these endless stories of they're not answering questions. Yeah, uh, they're not being quite straight and and. It's a curious strategy, I think, you know, if, if, if as they say, obviously, Keir Starmer's come out once again saying he's 100% stands by his deputy. Mm. She is saying there's absolutely no case to uh, answer. She's confident that she did absolutely nothing wrong. She's taken uh, tax and legal advice, she says, but then, you know, show that tax and legal but advice. But she's also deflecting it, saying, well, everyone should publish the last 15 years. No, if you've done nothing wrong, just show us the details from that transaction. Because, uh, obviously, as you say, we don't know all the facts on that. But also, it, it speaks to this wider issue about the murkiness of politics. Let's talk about the honours, for example. So, Mohammed Mansour, who gave the Conservative Party £5 million, has been given an honour. Lots of politicians, Mark Spencer, Philip Davis, Tracy Crouch, uh, Harriet Baldwin, also given honours. Again, it's jobs for the boys and girls, isn't it?
Yeah, and, and this, this honours list completely came out of the blue. Normally, honours are published um, at New Year's and the, the King's birthday, uh, and then when a Prime Minister leaves. So it is slightly bizarre to see this out, you know, completely unusual um, honours list. And, and, and as, as was pointed out yesterday, it does start to look like this is a Prime Minister knowing he's on the way out, um, probably doing some party management with those MPs um, for whatever reason on the list. So, but yeah, and then the donor, it just, it's not a great look, is it? I mean, no. we don't know, I, I have no idea about this person and, and their merits or demerits, but five million last year and then suddenly I don't, uh, you know, it, it's... Uh... What does it say about the timing of the election? Because, you're, you know, you said this is an unusual time to have honours. Does that mean the election is going is more likely to be sooner rather than later? God, I think we can all drive ourselves mad, and I think people <laughs> are driving ourselves mad in Westminster on the detail of when the election will be. Um, so, would I read into this about the election? I, I, I'm going to say no, just because otherwise we will spend our days um, in a spin. I, I'm relieved to hear that. We're, we're always <laughs> endless for oh, It could be January, November. We, we, we just don't know. One don't person know. knows what his, what's in exactly. his head, and that's Rishi Sunak. Mm. In the meantime, how difficult is the job becoming for the Prime Minister just to do the day-to-day -day actual politics when mm. conversations like we've just had are swirling? Absolutely. Very difficult. It's a difficult job, but it should be a difficult job. Mm. It's, it's Prime Minister, right? Um, uh, there was a story in, uh, in the Daily Mail yesterday about, uh, about the election, whether or not it's going to be in June, and there were some uh, quotes in there from sources saying that the Prime Minister is apparently asking his colleagues, am I doing a bad job? Why aren't I good at this? And, you know, sort of, that sort of thing is extraordinary, people are saying he's mm. saying that. Mm. Uh, of course, you would have sympathy that it's hard, but, but it should be hard. It's a very big job and it's a very big honour to do it. Uh, of course, and also at the same time, you've got Halfen and Heapy both mm. saying they're going to stand down. I think the tally is now 63 mm. Conservative MPs who are going to be standing down. Just, it, just in terms of that, Rishi Sunak, desperate to get some of his policies through, stop the boats. And, of course, the safety of Rwanda bill is on pause again until the Easter break. That's right, um, which was a blow uh, to, to the government. And I think they really were hoping for some flights in the spring. But then again, now they can spend the local election um, run up saying Labour's blocking, Labour's blocking our Rwanda policy and we're not getting flights off the ground. I'm sure that is what that will say. Earlier this week, the Prime Minister said he'd received uh, the worst sort of political inheritance of any Prime Minister in decades. Are we quick to forget, actually, and you might not have very much sympathy with that view, actually, um, are we quick, quick to forget the, the absolute turbulence in which he did arrive? Yes. Um... <laughs> Look, I, I, I think the turbulence is also what helped him get in. Mm. So he would never have got in if not for the turbulence. Course, so yeah. he should also probably acknowledge the fact that uh, he is an unelected prime minister and was quite lucky mm. personally to have got the job and should probably just get on with doing the job. Um, but I also think it's absolutely unquestionable that both politically it's a very difficult situation he inherited, but just the economy. I said at the, at the beginning of his term, he could be the best politician in the world. He'll still be hammered by the looming recession, by the post-COVID, um, uh, by the gas crisis, by, you know, the geopolitics yeah. um, and, and, and the massive, massive cost of living crisis, which really is, uh, I think, um, a very, very difficult thing to turn around. Very difficult indeed. Anna, thank you so much for coming and really good uh, to talk to you. Now, uh, an investigation by a British animal rights organisation has found that our free-range eggs might not be as free-range as we originally thought. This is the Animal Justice Project. Now, they flew drones over three RSPCA-accredited farms and subsequently discovered that thousands of chickens were being kept in cramped conditions, surrounded by um, skeletons. Sorry, this is quite graphic at this time of the morning. Skeletons of dead hens. Well, joining us now with more details is Animal Justice Project campaigner Tiana Smith, alongside poultry farmer Daniel Brown. Uh, Tiana, uh, let's start with you. These really are shocking revelations. What did you find? Yes, yeah, so in our investigation, we exposed three RSPCA shored free range farms, which all supply major supermarkets. And we really found some tr truly horrendous conditions. I mean, hens were suffering from illness, injuries such as prolapses, growths, twisted necks. Um, there was extreme feather loss. Some hens were almost threadbare with red raw um, patches on them. Severe bullying. We actually filmed one hen being pecked to death by other hens on camera. Um, as you were saying, there were dead bodies throughout the sheds left to decompose for clearly 
days or even weeks by the fact that they were kind of skeletons, hens were walking on piles of dead bodies. Um, and perhaps, yeah, most misleading to customers is that on all three of these farms, throughout the three farms, we didn't film any hens going outside. So pop holes were left unopened. And this was despite the fact that there were no bird flu restrictions in the area at the time. So it's really shocking, kind of abysmal conditions for hens marketed as high welfare and free range. Let's get to the bottom of this, Tano. Are you saying that the regulations aren't strong enough or that they're not being put into practice and then assessed and checked? Um, I would say probably both. Um, so RSPCA assured farms are supposed to have audits um, and they do have audits. Most of these audits are announced, um, but we have found a, a time and time again, Animal Justice Project has found that farms assured by uh, assurance bodies such as RSPCA assured and Red Tractor um, just aren't up to standard. They're just not they're just not protecting the welfare of the hens. Um, and I mean, on top of that, I would say that even if farms are following all of the guidelines, I mean, free range really isn't what the image that we see on these kind of glossy advertising, or like the, the supermarket videos, or even the pictures of hens kind of plucking happily in fields on the cartons, because in reality, it's up to 16,000 hens living in a shed, barely going outside, um, and living in these kind of intensive conditions. So I, I think that the public is being misled about what free range is. Uh, Daniel, you're a poultry farmer in my neck of the woods in, in Suffolk. Now, uh, there is an insatiable appetite for eggs. We eat a lot of eggs and there are regulations, aren't there, for you as a poultry farmer? There are an awful lot of regulations and um, we, we on our farm are audited by the Lion Code every six months, by RSPCA every six months, and then there are other bodies who can come in and audit as well. Um, I think what I want to say, having watched the video um, that Tiana's um, organisation have produced, is there are scenes in there which fall below the standard we would expect for a, for a free-range chicken farm. Um, but at the same time, there are things in that video, such as um, claiming that the nest boxes are closed. Well, it's the middle of the night. Nest boxes are closed at night. And there are also reasons why pop holes can be shut during the day. Um, I think one of the sheds, it turned out, um, there were actually no birds in. The bird, the, the shed was being cleaned out. And vets can give notices to have birds shut in for medical reasons during the day. Um, but, yeah, the, the demand for eggs keeps going up and up. The, the population keeps increasing. And, and they're a good source of um, all of the proteins and vitamins and minerals and things you need to mm. have a healthy diet. Daniel, when we buy a box of eggs and we look at what looks like marketing on there that makes us think, oh, I'm doing the right thing, I'm buying an egg that, from a chicken that's been looked after, a hen that's been looked after properly. When we buy something that says it's free range, what are we actually buying? What kind of conditions is a chicken supposed to be kept in? Well, you're buying an egg which the bird has to have access to the range from 9am until sunset every day. So the birds will wake up in the morning, probably 5 or 6am, They'll lay their egg in, in the nest box. They'll have feed and water ad lib so they can eat and drink whenever they like. Um, and then the pop holes should be open by 9 a.m. until sunset. So in the summer, that can be sort of 10 o'clock at night. In the winter, it's obviously a lot earlier. Um, the birds won't come in until it gets dark because they've got a natural homing instinct to come back into the shed and roost at night. Um, they, they, You don't sort of need to drive them back into the shed at night. That is just a natural instinct. They want to go back in there because that's where the food and water are and um, they're safe from predators in there. Um, so, so, Tiana, can, can I just come back to you on that? And Daniel says those potholes are, are closed at night, so therefore you wouldn't expect them to be open. Also, just, just in terms of your own, uh, your own organisation, are you, are you are campaigning for us to eat fewer eggs, are you? Um, so in terms of coming back to the pop hole, the, the, the filming that we did at the pop holes was all during the day. So that was at three separate farms um, on up to four different days and not in, not even necessarily consecutive days. So and um, we did re research, you know, bird flu restrictions in the area at the time. There weren't any. So we haven't got a clear answer as to why those pop holes weren't being opened. Um, in terms of our organisation, we um, we campaign to end an animal agriculture. Um, we don't we've done time and time again, we've done investigations that show that welfare doesn't make a meaningful difference to the lives of animals. Um, and, you know, we keep on we keep exposing these high welfare um, 
farms that are protected by these organizations by by assurance schemes and you know still we're exposing intense suffering of animals so um we would say that you don't need to eat eggs to be healthy there's plenty of other plant-based sources of protein that you can have um that don't subject animals to lives of suffering and you know even when even if hens um even if these rspca short guidelines are being followed i mean i don't know how if people are aware that like all male chicks in the egg industry are killed within um 24 hours of birth so they're gassed to death um that's because they have no use in the egg industry and um most free-range hens are slaughtered at 18 months we did an investigation last year showing the kind of violent uh, process of catching which happens at the end of a hen's life when their uh, egg production has dropped um and they are sent to the slaughterhouse at 18 months when naturally they would live much longer than that so th there's still cruelty involved even if uh farms are following all of these for time we just we have to leave this discussion here but thank you so much i really appreciate hearing both sort of sides of this quite complex uh, story tiana simmons um, a campaigner with the animal justice project and also daniel brown poultry farmer uh, in uh, suffolk look we, we spoke to the rspca they said this footage is understandably upsetting and while we suspended all three farms we are launching urgently our own investigation they say welfare concerns on assured certified farms are rare and millions more animals are having a better life thanks to the charity yeah, a very, very complex story indeed. And of course, as I said, an insatiable appetite uh, for eggs still in this country. Well, still to come on Talk Today, petrol prices continue to hit us in the pocket. And pennies for pints. Find out where in the world sells the cheapest alcohol. The former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley and the writer Candice Holdsworth are here to take a look through this morning's papers. This is Talk Today, 22 minutes past eight. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8 and 25. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Now, fancy buying 20 pints and still having change from a fiver. Yes, you heard that right. Find out where in the world you'd have to travel to in the papers next. A mounting problem before nine will be joined by someone who has climbed the world's highest peaks to discuss if Everest is becoming overloaded with tourists. And today marks exactly 10 years since the first gay marriage ceremonies were carried out in England and Wales. We're going to speak to someone celebrating their 10th anniversary today. First, should we go to check on the weather? I'm sorry, it's gloomy news for the Easter weekend. <laughs> Isabel, what's in store? I mean, it's not as bad as yesterday. Yesterday was... Great. Just the worst. It really was. Awful for travelling, not just on the road, but also the rail. All sorts of disruption. Today is showery, but the weekend, at least Saturday and Sunday, just a little better. Um, not too bad, some sunshine around, but let's take a look at the whole detail. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Still overwhelmingly unsettled and shary, but there will be a couple of days of drier weather for more of us. And at this time of year, and also as we start to see the uh, evenings lengthening, uh, clocks changing, of course, this weekend, there will be some warmer, sunnier spells. But as we head into next week, unfortunately, we've got low pressure creeping in again to bring some cool winds and rain for the south on Monday. And then after that, low pressure systems come in one after another, bringing some really wet weather, particularly to the south and west, which has been in inundated with rain recently. Really disappointing. Out there today for Good Friday, it's a sunshine and showers type day. Again, some heavy showers, but not as widespread or sort of clustering together as much as they did yesterday. In Scotland, we do start off with rain for central and eastern areas, but that will tend to clear. And then it's sunshine and showers for the afternoon, showery for Northern Ireland. Some quite heavy showers with hail and thunder for central and northern parts of England and Wales. But I'm pretty hopeful of some drier, sunny weather to end the day across southeast England, East Anglia and along the south coast. Temperatures up to about 12 or 13, so a little better generally than yesterday. And then as we head through this evening and tonight, I should think most of the showers will gradually ease their way up into Scotland and a few will come into more western parts, Ireland, the far southwest, for example. Many central and eastern areas will end up being dry. We lose the shower activity. Could turn a little misty with some fog patches, maybe the odd pocket of frost as well. But I should think temperatures, generally speaking, will hold up at around four or five degrees. But a bit chilly out there first thing tomorrow. And Saturday does look as though there will be some showers, but they'll be mainly across the far north and later in the southwest, which means that many central areas should actually have a decent enough day with some sunshine, not too bad at all. In the afternoon, then, for Scotland, showers in the north may be more scattered in central and southern areas. Temperatures up to 11 in Glasgow. Northern Ireland, I think, quite a focus for heavy showers and gusty winds. And for England and Wales, a bit of a westy split for sunshine. Western areas sunniest. Eastern areas seeing a little rain near the east coast, but uh, cloudier, generally speaking. And then on the Easter day, sunshine and showers, but the showers mostly in the southwest. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, writer Candice Holdsworth and former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley are here with us for a final look through this morning's uh, papers. Shall we, shall we kick off, Charlie, with the anniversary, a terrible anniversary, actually. This is the Sun, page 10, of Evan Gershevitz, the Wall Street Journal uh, reporter. He was jailed in Russia for false espionage uh, charges. Obviously, a colleague of ours. Mm. Absolutely, and someone who um, uh, would have been based under the Wall Street Journal in this very building. Um, it is a year since he was uh, on a uh, writer's mission, 900 miles uh, east of Moscow, where he was hooded, uh, wrongly arrested, and has been falsely imprisoned uh, under these espionage charges. Uh, no American citizen um, has been uh, uh, charged like this since the Cold War. Um, he clearly has uh, no case to answer, but he has been locked up in one of the most abhorrent jails uh, known uh, on this earth for 23 hours a day, only allowed out uh, for an hour a day, where he's often seen uh, walking up and down the courtyard. He is a big Arsenal fan, and Arsenal Football Club um, uh, do their best to sort of raise banners at the North Bank. Um, I know that as an Arsenal fan myself, just to try and keep spirits up. Uh, and those messages filter through to him, and that gives him um, a, a little sense of a, a boost and joy to know that we're all thinking about him. And staff here only the other day posed for a photograph in the lobby to try and uh, obviously put pressure on the, uh, on the uh, Russian authorities, as well as the UN, uh, to get him released. Yeah, and that's what's behind 
and these badges that we're we're wearing mm. today obviously it's just a token but it's so important we talk about this what we've learned um candace is that actually appearing in court and things the russians kind of expecting him to be sort of crying or distressed but he shows this in the most extreme circumstances remarkable resilience his mum says when she's gone to these hearings before he, he's really He's relaxed. I mean, you kind of think, how, how can you possibly be like that in, in the circumstances you're in? It's, it, it is. I mean, if you've ever read the, the Gulag Archipelago as well by Solzhenitsyn, I mean, you know, these accounts of people who are being held under the most unfair circumstances, under what was then the Soviet Union. We hoped that Russia would change, but no, it's gone back to many of its old ways. And people deal with it in incredible ways. I mean, mm. they just find the strength within themselves, within themselves to survive these circumstances. And I think it's because he knows that he did nothing wrong and that he's being used possibly as leverage for a prisoner exchange. Oh, without mm. doubt, without mm. doubt. And all, all the cards are with Russia at the moment. And, of yeah. course, I think the solidarity, and you can sense it in the building, actually, the solidarity and everyone standing mm. together and remembering this very brave journalist who, uh, for no fault of his own, there we are, there lots of uh, our colleagues are in the foyer of this building, standing together with Evan. Uh, our thoughts and prayers go to him and indeed his family, of mm. course, because uh, it's a, a shocking case. Candice, let's move on to the eye, though, shall we? Uh, this is about petrol prices. Uh, guess what? They're too high. Well, they are. I mean, this is an ongoing issue. So the Competition and Markets Authority have said that the um, supermarkets need to start passing on savings to consumers, but it's just not happening. Mm. And you're finding that they're a lot higher and that profit margins have risen by quite a lot, which indicates that there's not enough competition. You, we, I do know that Claire Cotino, the energy secretary, she's trying to rectify this with a new app called Pumpwatch, which she thinks will introduce more competition and transparency by publishing data on different prices at different forecourts so you can find the cheapest price. It's a good idea. I just wonder if you'll end up with huge queues mm -hmm. at the cheapest forecourts. I mean, there have been apps before where you did this, because I've certainly got one where I would look at the cheapest petrol prices. But it does seem an ent entire lottery as to as how much you're paying at the pumps. It doesn't seem to be very fair, Charlie. No. Yeah, it's not. And it's, um, look, you know, the government can only do so much to sort of, you know, freeze fuel duty, which it has tends to do every year. Mm -hmm. and what it did in the latest budget, you know, if there's another budget to come before the next election, will it be frozen again? Could it be cut? Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, a, a little goes a long way. And whilst that is the case, it is still... Um, uh, a burden on, on motorists who have to pay these uh, high fuel prices. Talking about freezing charges, the BBC licence fee was frozen for two years. That changes. It's gone up to, I think, just shy of £170 per household. Uh, Charlie, at the end of the BBC is undoubtedly on its way. This is uh, the words of Doctor Who's uh, creator. Of course, the organisations had to change shape and there are still these big political questions about... Who, who funds uh, the broadcaster? What's the latest? That, that, that's absolutely right. It's um, uh, uh, Russell R.T. Davies, who's a brilliant writer, a writer of Doctor Who, but also um, uh, a queer as folk back in the 90s, and mm -hmm. It's a Sin that people might remember. So a brilliant, well-acclaimed, award-winning writer now coming... Uh, uh, forward to say that actually maybe it is time to uh, revamp the BBC, look mm -hmm. again at the licence fee, uh, because the BBC on its own can't fund projects like Doctor Who, if you want to bring uh, great sort of uh, 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 TV programmes uh, like that. It has to be in collaboration with um, people like Disney, with Amazon, with Netflix, um, and that obviously allows great content to be produced. It allows the BBC to still have a stake in producing that for uh, for the UK, but also at a lower cost to um, individuals that wouldn't have to necessarily pay the licence. And, of course, they're competing on a global marketplace, aren't they, Candice? So, so, as Charlie mentions, the BBC and Disney there for Doctor Who, but also the BBC is doing too many things, I think. And it, it's, it's, it's basically broadening its umbrella. We've seen that in the music, for example, directly competing with music stations like Greatest Hits Radio. The yes. BBC is doing Doing too much. It needs to, to. It needs to be much more narrowly focused. And Tim Davy himself. What are I you think, suggesting has... that they they scrap the music radio? No, channels. no. So they're having more and more stations as a result of what they're trying to do. But Tim Davy, I think, is also signalling that the licence fee is on its way out. Well, we're, we're in the era now of digital subscriptions. So you know, people will question how much can this particular model that the BBC has last where people have lots of different options and in terms of what you consume in content 
from the BBC, some people will get high value out of the license fee because they'll watch the whole breadth of content, whereas some will only watch a little bit, and so they won't get as much value. So you have to wonder, you know, do they need to start disaggregating that in some way? I think my only question is, with all this disaggregation going on in the content market, how many subscriptions can you sign up to? I mean, yeah. I feel like I've already mm. got about a million. <laughs> I would like more package deals. I really would. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that's right, because, I, I, you know, and, and to your point, David, I think the BBC, what it what it should do is go back to its fundamental principles of just you know, being able to educate, inform, and entertain. And I think you do have your you know, educational programmes, which I think are well worth every penny of the licence fee. Mm. You can have your information and you know, the documentaries that we see that the BBC produce have been absolutely fantastic. Or the news production. The news production, and indeed. The music as well. Um, uh, 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 but no, no better than this news programme, no, exactly. um, obviously. Well <laughs> but, but, but entertainment, you know, things like Strictly Come Dancing, I'm partial mm. to a... Um, uh, you're uh, not alone. Millions band. of people are <laughs> 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 um, Let's talk about our pets, uh, Candice. Um, there's going to be uh, new measures to the microchipping system. Now, I'm not a pet owner. I don't know if you or either of you are. Um, in, in an effort, really, to try and deter... We saw that dog thefts are on a rise. Yes. Um, to stop dogs being stolen and cats, but then also uh, to make sure it's easier to find them if they've got lost. Yeah, so this is an attempt to sort of centralise and create better records for the, the pet microchipping system. So if your pet gets stolen, then you can report it as lost or stolen. If at some point in the future they turn up at another vet, that information is there, mm. and then they can start organising some kind of owner transference. They've said, though, that the, the owner who presents at the vet with that pet will get a chance, though, to object to that. So, I mean, it won't immediately be that, oh, my gosh, this dog is stolen. Right, we're taking it away from you. You do have a little bit of time to say, hang on a minute, I don't think that's right. The thing is, many people buy pets online from unscrupulous sellers. Mm. They have no idea what the provenance of this dog is. Mm. They don't know if they're stolen or not. And, you know, people really do need to be very, very discerning and, and buy from reputable places and be very, very careful about where you get dogs from. I mean, I'm a dog owner, and sometimes it just shocks me how unregulated the whole pet, um, uh, pet, pet marketplace is. Mm. Yes, I mean, you just people have people answer a, an ad on Facebook for a dog, a dog who might be six, seven years old. There might be some story attached to it. But you've got no idea if that story mm. is true or of not. Of course, yeah. Of course. Uh, Charlie, shall we move uh, to a, a story that I'm very interested in uh, about cheap beer? Um, where, where, do you get, um, where do you get a pint of beer for 20p? Well, um, and certainly not in London. <laughs> no, 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 I can tell you. I mean, a pint of beer in London is a ridiculous price. Well, uh, but you're, but you're absolutely right, because um, in Ni uh, Niberia, um, it costs just 20p for a 60 uh, centilitre bottle of beer. Um, uh, and in the, um, uh, it's closely followed by uh, Belarus, China and Vietnam, all low-cost pints. So if anyone's going out over the Easter weekend in those, uh, those countries, you're going to have a whale of a time. Um, mm. But it says um, that the highest beers uh, to buy are in the uh, United, Ab <laughs> uh, United Ab Arab Emirates, if I can get my words out, uh, where the average cost of a pint is £8.51. And I thought, uh, compared to the UK average, which apparently the UK average for a pint of beer in this country is uh, £4.00. Uh, not here, uh, something not... four pounds twenty, which I thought was I'd pay four pound twenty for a pint. I mean, I haven't seen it four pound twenty. <laughs> so you're in the wrong place. I mean, you wrong place. So you mentioned Liberia. This is Nigeria's star lager. This mm. is Nera, uh, uh, about three. Yeah, so amazing that twenty p. But you're right. I mean, it is. It's it's very dependent where you shop, where you go to the pub, which sort of pub, and where it is geographically in this country. And I think even the other thing, I mean, I, um, uh, you know, for what it's worth, for viewers that want to know, um, I, I, I tend not to drink at home. I'm not a big home drinker. I like to go out to socialise. I like to go to a pub. I like to meet friends. I think it's a social, you know. Um, but obviously, with the increase in the price of alcohol, people do turn to the supermarkets. They buy in bulk, yes. you know. Uh, people do drink at home a bit more. And, and landlords and, are absolutely in despair about that. You know, we talk how many times yeah. on this programme about the number of pubs closing. Mm. I'm sorry to end it on a bit of a sour note, but have a happy bank holiday weekend. Mm, well. We're off to the pub. Yeah. We're off to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. Yeah. Candice, Charlie, it's been a pleasure this yes. morning. Uh, happy Easter and thank you again. Yeah, thank happy you. Easter to both of you. Now you've been getting in touch uh, with all uh, your stories. We were talking about free-range eggs and, and we're asking also this morning, do you trust the branding when it says free-range? Do you actually know what you're buying? No, I don't anymore, says Nicole. There were bird flu scares recently and the free-range chickens were required to stay indoors. They were still allowed to stay labelled as free-range. 
range. Travis says free range is horrific and a meaningless marketing phrase. Um, everything we're talking about, we'd love to have your input. You can email us, talk today at talk.tv, or you can text as well. Talk and your message to 8722. Yes. Now, motorists looking to get away over this bank holiday weekend will be hitting the roads alongside an estimated 18.5 million people. So here comes traffic jams, <laughs> bustling airports and train stations. And we're hearing this phrase, Armageddon. Oh, fantastic. Well, talk today's correspondent, Nick Ellaby, has hit the road. Uh, we can cross to him now. Good morning. Oh, well, right. <laughs> Good morning, Nick. I was about to say, where are you? But you're obviously in a car. Yeah, morning, David. Morning, Rosie. Happy Easter as well. We're coming to you live from the car. I'm here with uh, cameraman Tony, but he's, uh, he's driver Tony now as well. Uh, so, you know, he does it all. Um, good to see him, though, for the first time. We've been driving around quite a lot this morning. We've come from the M25 on the west side of London, which is supposed to be that, that bit to avoid, certainly from about 11 o'clock this morning through until the early afternoon. Now, uh, the, the, the really bad part is, is probably coming off the M25 onto the M3, where we are now, from about 11.30 this morning through to mid-afternoon. That could be really nasty. With, they're talking about double journey times from the M25 down to Southampton. And the airports as well around London, some of them expecting their busiest Easter ever. So Gatwick uh, coming off on the M23, that's going to be busy. And then the whole of the M25 right up to the top uh, when you come off of the M1 for Hertfordshire. And you've got Luton Airport there as well. Lots of people making getaways. Uh, we've been speaking to a number of people uh, on the motorway, get, trying to beat the traffic this morning. And here's what they told us about why they were up so early. We're going to Poole and uh, we're up early because we knew we'd miss the traffic so we left at 6.15, didn't we? We were supposed to leave at 6 but obviously it was 6.15 by the time we left and yeah, so far we have missed the traffic. I left Watford about quarter to seven and I'm going to my son but I'm not going to go in straight to him, I'm going to the garden centre first and have a coffee because he won't be up if I get there too early. <laughs> I mean, are you trying to beat the rush? What's well, the yeah, well, I don't, when I drive on my own, I don't, I hate getting stuck in traffic jams, get claustrophobic. <laughs> so lots of people trying to beat that rush, lots of people heading to the south coast and the west country. The other place to avoid is the M5, certainly from lunchtime onwards, from Bristol down to Taunton, that's going to be really nasty. And then up in the north as well, the roads around the Lake District, the A590, the A591, I would try and avoid those, you know, as best you can, or, or journey early in the morning or late at night. I'm also hearing the queue at the moment for the Dover ferry terminal is now one hour. You've got increased checks from the French side as well. And then the trains, you've got the West Coast main line, um, which is closed between London and Milton Keynes. So that's affecting anyone trying to get either from the south to the northwest or the other way around. So, you know, lots of delays expected. The RAC are expecting 2.6 million journeys today and 14 million journeys, up to 18 million over the weekend. So the best thing to do is try and try and journey early or late at night. And certainly if you are there in the middle of the day, just check your oil, check your tire pressure, check you've got enough fuel. I mean, these are the basics, but you know, two out of the three most popular ways to break down are tires and fuel. So just, just RSA just saying, just have a look at those before you set off. But you know, the sun's out now. It's looking a bit better. It stopped raining here on the south coast. So, um, you know, I wish everybody in the studio and everyone at home a happy Easter. And I'm going to, uh, you know, enjoy myself. I'm going to get through all of this in one go, David. Cheers. But before you do that, Nick, now you've taken a big mouthful. I mean, the traffic looks quite clear right now. Um, I've heard a rumour, maybe, that soon you might be contributing to some of the traffic because you're learning to drive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, so... I'm 39. It's a little bit late, really, isn't it? I, I've lived in cities and uh, near railway stations my whole life, so I've left it pretty late. So thank God Tony's on hand. Tony's been all right this morning, hasn't it? Yeah, it's not too bad. It's only going to get worse, though. Well, well there you go. So, what look, a gloomy note to if, end if, it on. If, 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 you're ready to, if you're ready to leave the house, get out. Yeah, go early. Nick, thank you so much. And good luck with your driving lessons. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for driving Nick uh, so safely sure. this morning. Um, lots to come here on the programme. We're going to be asking, should tourists still be allowed to climb Everest? We certainly will be. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen! <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.47. Now, a British woman who was climbing Mount Everest has had to be airlifted to hospital after being brutally attacked by a yak. Well, the climbing season has started, and with it comes new rules to protect the peak, which has been described as the world's highest rubbish heap. Well, the deteriorating environment has led to calls to ban tourists from the mountain, as has the danger. Last year, 18 people died, believed to be the worst year on record. Seven were local guides or members of the Nepalese army trying to clean up the mountain. We're joined now by mountaineer Anne Hinks and the environmental campaigner Donika McCarthy. Thank you both so much. Um, Alan, you know, from you, your experience and the kind of challenge and relishing seeing those incredible views, what is it that makes climbing so, so appealing and something like Everest? Well, I guess Everest, obviously, is the highest mountain in the world. So it is a great achievement to do it. And um, it's not as dirty as people make out. Modern expeditions are more environmentally aware and they have vested interests because they're going year after year. They go every year at this time in March, April, May. So it's not as dirty as, as it's made out. But, yeah, there is some equipment abandoned, shall, shall I say, you know, uh, little bits of it. There, it's iconic, is Everest, I guess. And... Um, you know, sometimes it gets denigrated and people say it's easy because there's fixed ropes there which help you get to the top and there's guides like me can help you get to the top and the local Nepalese Sherpas. So you can pay quite a lot of money and have a reasonable chance of getting to the top, but it should never be denigrated because, you know, you, it is dangerous. As you just said, people get killed every year. And there is only a handful of people ever summited Everest, let's say a few thousand and double figures probably. And that's not many when you think about it when there's 8 billion people on the planet. 
Uh, how would you counter that, Donica? Uh, ju just in terms of that, Alan says it's a great thing to do. Lots of people interested in climbing. It, it is. It is regulated. Money goes into the Nepalese economy as well. Yeah, we have to actually also yeah. remember the, the climate impacts of, of long haul tourism. Every a family of four flying to Nepal emits around eight tons of carbon. To put that in context, they would have to turn all their electricity off for 16 years before they would make up that amount of pollution. And the impacts of climate uh, breakdown on Nepal is already unfolding. They have lost 30% of the ice pack in the Himalayas in Nepal and so having huge impact on their agriculture industry. 70% of the Nepalese uh, GDP economy depends on agriculture and climate change has given them horrific floods and horrific droughts and, and impacting on, on their economy already. So I think we need to start thinking about holiday in Britain, uh, rock climbing in Britain, mountain climbing in Britain. We can get trains to the Alps from, from, from Britain. We don't need to cross the planet and destroy the planet to actually do these type of, of adventures. Alan, how do you answer the, the I think, very legitimate concerns about doing something like climbing Everest does come along with some climate consequences, chiefly in, in how you get there. Well, so does anything. You know, you talk about, you know, there's going to be traffic jams today in Britain. That's going to have a massive climate impact, you could say. Or does it? But, um, you know, at the end of the day, whatever man does is going to affect certain amount of uh, the climate, certainly going to add to pollution. I don't think not going to Nepal is the answer. The Nepalese need us to go there. That's all they've got. They haven't got any coal mines. They haven't got any shipbuilding. They haven't got any other industry. They've only got tourism, really. And they're welcome tourists and they need tourists. Mm. Um, and um, so, I mean, mm. going climbing in Britain is great, but that doesn't mean you're going to get up the highest mountain in the world. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're going to help the Nepalese unless you send them charity, I guess. Mm. Do you think the sort of uh, the beauty, Alan, of, of climbing Everest has maybe been slightly tarnished or spoiled? All of us will be able to bring to mind pictures of those long queues of people waiting to summit. Has it lost something special that it had when you did it? Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, I did it a long time ago, last century, 1996, and there was only three of us on the summit. There's no doubt it's not the same as it was, mm. but neither is, is uh, most mountains. You know, if it's a nice weekend, you can get 6,000 people on Snowden. Um, whereas Everest might only have a few hundred. And yes, there's that picture of 200 people in a queue, but that's on one day. The next day, there might be nobody. And the day after that, there might be 30. And the day after that, nobody. So there's, there's nobody on Everest at the moment. They'll all be trekking in next month, uh, getting ready to climb and summiting in May. And then there'll be nobody on Everest again, climbing Everest until April next year, uh, there will be trekkers going to base camp and they help the economy more than climbers because there's thousands of trekkers trekking Nepal. Um, so I would encourage people to go to Nepal, contrary to what the other chaps said. <laughs> you know, the Nepalese are lovely people. It's a great place. Nepal's nearly as nice as Yorkshire. Go there and help mm. the Nepalese. Do Donica, doesn't Alan have a really good point there? It's one thing to climb a mountain in this country, but it's quite something different to challenge yourself to, to climb in Nepal. Also, tourism, as Alan says, is the biggest source of income for That's them. That's true. So, well, cannot... sorry, let me just finish. They, they have permits. You have to be regulated. So you've got money coming into Nepal. This is a country that desperately needs it. Well, I mean, I think that Alan's entitled to his, his joy of actually flying across the planet and trashing it. However, he's not entitled to his facts. The fact is 6% of the Nepalese comes, economy comes from tourism and they're already spending 5% on the impacts of the extreme weather it's triggering. So it's almost already a net loss for Nepal. 70% of the population depends on the agriculture. With droughts and floods, that agriculture gets decimated. This is the talk of a, a rich person. Only 4% of the planet flies abroad every year, David, and that is a rich elite. The 1% of the top world's population of which Alan is a part of, emits 66% of, of the emissions of the poorest part of the planet. And we cannot continue this way. It's a rich look. You look, for example, what, one of the interesting points about this yak story is it was by a woman who was on a charity uh, out uh, 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 raising trip. Now, it costs between 30,000 and 130,000 to have um, so people like Alan supporting you to get to the top of, 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 uh, of the Himalayas. 
why not spend that £130,000 on charity and on actually investing in, 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 in Nepal and helping its economy rather than destroying it? Well, Donica, would you support maybe an idea that says, look, you can climb Everest, but it comes along with an even more significantly high uh, price tag, let's say uh, pricing of carbon offsetting? Well, if you want to actually, if it costs you £160,000 to climb it, spend £160,000 uh, uh, fee to actually help the Nepalese economy. Let's do it that way. Alan, could you raise fees? Well, the fees are quite high as it, as it is. You could put extra on, I guess. Um, but, I mean, you know, I've heard all these arguments before about not going to Nepal, but, I mean, people fly all over the world just to do marathons, you know, and people at the moment will be flying to Spain, they'll be flying to Greece from Britain, and we're not rich people. Um, yes, we're richer than the people in Nepal. I mean, the agriculture is talking about Nepal is a subsistence economy. They feed each other. Um, I don't think there's much Nepal exports, but, you know, you might contradict me on that. Um, you know, tourism is realism. I don't think the people in Spain are going to um, be happy if you cut the flights to Spain. Yes, you could go by train, but it takes quite a while to go to Greece by train. We, we, could, we know, could talk we, about this all morning, I believe. Cut all the flights? Alan and Donica, thank you both so much. Uh, and a confession to make from me, um, I am getting the train to go to Paris next weekend to do the Paris Marathon, and part of the, the, the train is more expensive than the plane. Well, there's a surprise. So, you know, that's another element of this, of this story. <laughs> um, less about me, lots more to come here on the programme. There's no magic money tree. That's the warning Sir Keir Starmer's issued to struggling councils ahead of the general election and local elections in May. We'll bring you everything you need to know next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. 
This is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Rosie Wright. And a very good morning. It's 9 o'clock now, Friday the 29th of March. Yeah, we talk today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Sir Keir Starmer's launched Labour's local election campaign but told struggling councils there's no magic, magic money tree. Meanwhile, the deputy leader, Angela Rayner, insisted she's done nothing wrong over the sale of her council house in 2015. A year of Yousaf after 12 months in charge at Holyrood, a poll finds Hamza Yousaf less popular than Nicola Sturgeon. And happy anniversary. It's exactly 10 years since the first gay marriage ceremonies in England and Wales. We'll be speaking to one man who's celebrating. Some heavy showers and thunderstorms again today, but tomorrow and Easter Sunday look a little drier for more of us. we a bit of sunshine as well, and it will feel just a little bit warmer too. Fantastic stuff. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Isabel. You're getting in touch with lots of things. We're talking about Everest as well. We were talking about the mesh. Should tourists be allowed to climb Mount Everest? Email us, talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talktv. Text the word talk in your message to 8722. And whilst you do that, it's now time for your headlines with Katie. Thank you, David. Good morning. The family of journalist Evan Gershevich has been renewed calls for his release, one year since he was illegally detained by Russia. Evan, who works for the Wall Street Journal, was detained while doing his job. He's being held on spying charges, despite Russia producing no evidence of this. Well, Evan's colleagues here at News UK stand with him. Activities and rallies are taking place in the coming days in support of his release. Angela Rayner's colleagues are rallying around her amid a tax row over the sale of her council house. The deputy Labour leader says she's confident she hasn't broken any rules. Party chair Annalise Dodds agrees. Complete confidence in her. And, you know, really, I think we need to ask the question, why are we seeing this petty politicking coming from the Conservatives. You know, I know that rather than talking about the finances of one individual, many people watching this will be saying, well, hang on, why aren't politicians talking about family finances? Drivers are being warned to expect long delays on the roads for the Easter getaway. More than 14 million trips are expected, and at least three major airports say they're expecting this to be their busiest Easter weekend on record. An eight-year-old girl is the sole survivor of a bus crash in South Africa, which claimed 45 lives. Authorities are investigating what caused the vehicle to plunge 50 metres off a bridge and burst into flames. It was taking pilgrims from Botswana's capital to an Easter service. And we're not expecting to see Kate Middleton this Easter while uh, she's been treated for cancer, of course. But King Charles is expected to make an appearance at Windsor Castle's Easter Sunday service alongside Camilla the Queen. You're up to date. I'll be back at 10 o'clock with more headlines for you. Thank you very much. Now on to our top story. Sir Keir Starmer has said that councils won't get more cash under a Labour government because there is no magic money tree. Labour's also claimed that people who live in council areas under its control are better off and pay an average of £276 less council tax than Conservative-run authorities. Well, we took a little bit of issue with that. <laughs> when did. we spoke to uh, Annalise Dodds earlier on the programme, and one of the th key things, and we've just heard more about that from Katie there in the headlines, is that Annalise Dodds is one of many in the Labour Party still supporting uh, the deputy Labour leader. Let's get into all of this now. Yes, let's do exactly that. Assistant editor at The Spectator, Cindy Yu, joins us this morning. Good morning, Good morning. Cindy. Uh, this Rainer stuff won't go away, will it? It just won't go away. And it's not about... And Starmer now standing behind us saying, mm. yes, I believe that she's done all the right things. And uh, But actually, it's not about that. It's about the optics, the principle. And here we go again, grubby politics. Yeah, it's very, very tricky. You know, this happened before she became an MP. And I've just been reading up about it. All the complicated legal and tax related things because it's not just capital gains tax there are other things discounts that she may have had if it wasn't if it was her primary residence uh, but but people are saying that it's not so it's incredibly complicated and so one can understand if it's an honest mistake she made before she became an MP but she's saying that she didn't make this mistake at all she's com completely insisting that that was still her primary residence even though neighbors at both 
places say that they never saw her there. Um, so it is incredibly tricky. And for Starmer to be putting his own reputation on the line, Annalise Dodds too, as viewers have seen, you know, if more comes out in the story later on and no answers are forthcoming so far, so people are going to keep asking questions, then it's their own reputations on the line too. Mm. How, how much actually do these stories hurt parties when they happen? Do the public just think, oh, it's just typical politicians? Or could this actually hurt the Labour Party? I think for Angela Rayner, the amount of money that we're talking about here is relatively small. If you mm. think back to Nadim Zahawi, who had his own troubles with HMRC uh, a year or two ago, mm. it was about £4.8 million pounds in unpaid taxes. So this is totally <laughs> different <laughs> kettle of fish. So in that sense, you know, the scale is different. But Angela Rayner is one of those down-to-earth politicians. It's that principle, isn't it? Yeah, mm. he, she is someone who you don't expect this kind of story to be following around. She, you know, she is meant to be down-to-earth. She's meant to be a woman of the people. She didn't go to university. She had a teenage pregnancy. All of these things. So for her own personal brand, if she's found to have made mistakes here and then lied about it, that would be very damaging. And if the Labour Party have to lose her, then I think Keir Starmer loses a very effective lieutenant when it comes to the campaign uh, this year. So, so Labour's in quite an interesting position here because it's about what Labour doesn't do. They really just have to tread water because, of course, the poll lead is very convincing. When you look at the latest poll from The Sun, and we've got that, the voting intention is 45% to vote Labour, 24% for the Tories, and 12% for reform. Now, that comes on the back of the YouGov a poll again very very similar but puts uh, various slight differences in there with reform actually doing better there's been a call from some conservatives saying that reform needs to do a deal with the conservative party what do you make of that this is so interesting so it's been reported that some conservatives are saying rishi give nigel farage the ambassador to washington role and tell him don't fight against us in certain constituencies I mean, A, voters don't like this, these kinds of deal. You know, people like to know that they're voting for, you know, all the options in their constituency and the people higher up are not telling them who they can and can't mm. vote for. So I think there will be some reputational damage to reform for doing that. But on the other hand, um, Nigel Farage does want to, you know, he's been saying recently that he's been made more money now than he's made in the 30 years of politics, um, that he's enjoying post-politics life. Um, and Donald Trump might be coming back in the US and he mm. loves picking up their friendship. So it could be a pretty plummy role for him. Um, but, you know, when a frontline politics calls, a campaigner like Nigel Farage, can he really say no? And he's definitely <laughs> left the door open for that. And, and he's enjoying the speculation. I mean, absolutely. how long yeah. have we been talking about this? You think at some point he's going to have to cho yeah. choose a side? And we, we also know that he may be forced to, to, to have to make, declare that because there's some complications about, you know, people standing politically also hosting news programmes. And of course, he falls yes. into, that, into that category. For now, though, the Labour Party, all they've really got to do is kind of hold still, steady, not make any slip-ups. We learned yesterday a little bit, didn't we, as they launched their local election campaign, mm. what that's going to look like, the vision. And quite a lot of uh, phrases and ideas borrowed, actually, from the Conservatives. Yes, we heard about um, them praising Boris Johnson's idea of levelling up. Mm. We heard this phrase from Keir Starmer a few times, that we're going to take back control. <laughs> I mean, you kind of think... Pardon? What's happening here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Season five of British politics post-Brexit has <laughs> <It's> really <laughs> gone full circle. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a smart move from them. It's a smart move. This is what the Conservatives do all the time, right? They take Labour policies and they kind of force Labour into positions that really actually Labour doesn't want to be in. Um, we saw that with a non-DOM tax status uh, early in the budget uh, this month. So for Labour to say, you know, levelling up was a good idea, but Rishi Sunak, the current Prime Minister, hasn't made it happen because he, you know, A, doesn't care about you guys, B, doesn't know how you feel, all this sort of stuff. I think that's a really effective way of doing politics, especially going up to the local elections. But Starmer also said there's no magic money tree, again sounding like yeah. the Tories. So I think for the Labour Party, Rosie, you're totally right, they, all they have to do is hold still until the election now, but afterwards, they're not going to be able to fix a lot of the economic mm. problems that the Conservatives have been facing either. And I think voters are going to be going to very quickly realise that. How much of this is actually people tired of the government and wanting a change? Because when you look at the, the poll as well, just in terms of the parties that, that people think will best manage things like the economy, cut taxes, stop the small boats and so on, it's Labour that comes out well, in, in, including improving the NHS. This is about people's lived experiences. Mm. So we know the NHS is falling apart. You've got 7 million people, 8 million people waiting for elective procedures, another hidden waiting list as well. But, but the reality is, if Labour gets in, 
they're going to be facing monumental problems. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, when people say that we trust Labour more on these things, Labour haven't said much about their policies at all, right? So um, when you when you mention the, how much of this is about kicking the current party in power, I think it is very much about that. You know, it's, it's the mentality of they surely can't be worse than the Conservatives, which maybe is a fair point. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not as if Labour have said much actively about any of these areas, really. And we've talked about financially how much headroom they've actually got to do new radical things if they get elected. But one of the questions I think people have got is, and you've sort of maybe hinted at this already, Cindy, if the Labour Party are then elected, for how long will they have that public support yeah. to say they'd actually stay in power for? Because people suddenly realise things aren't improving here either. So I think Labour have a slightly more political leeway to be slightly tougher on public finances mm. because they are the party from the left. You know, when it comes to, the, for example, things like the doctor's strikes, for example, they can go to the unions and say, you have to get behind us now. We just simply can't afford this. In a way, that's more palatable than Tories telling them that. So mm. I think politically, they do have slightly more room. But sooner or later, voters are going to realise mm. that actually the economy is the way it is. Um, and, you know, Labour can do things to fix that. But A, we don't know what those things are. And B, often these policies will take some time to come in as well. Mm. Labour haven't said what money raising methods they're going to use, other than a non dom tax status reform, <laughs> which the Tories Which apparently have just is paying for everything. Yeah, I mean, which apparently is paying for everything. And now the Tories have taken that anyway. So what does, how, does, how is Labour going to have more fiscal headroom than the Conservatives are going to? I'm, I'm not sure. But they don't, again, they don't have to answer that question right now. So All what, they have to do is. What, what's the gossip on, on these honours? Because normally we see them at the New Year, we see them on the King's birthday. And here we are with some more more honours. And Rishi Sunak, what does this say about what Rishi Sunak is doing? This is Mohammed Mansour who yes. gave five million quid to yes. the Conservative Party. And then lots of politicians, Mark Spencer, Philip Davis, Tracy Crouch, Harriet Baldwin, also honouring people involved with Oppenheimer, the movie. What does this say about the state of where Rishi Sunak is, how long he's got to go? Also, if the local elections are absolutely appalling, are they going to boot him out? I'd rather see Christopher Nolan given <laughs> a peerage, I think, than, 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 than a billionaire who is only good for the Conservative Party. And I'm not sure about the politics behind all of this, actually. And it's Easter break, it's recess, so maybe the situation is less febrile. But coming on the back of the Frank Hester row, I'd yeah. have thought that the Conservative Party wouldn't want to raise more attention to its dodgy donors. So I, I'm not sure about how smart it is to give um, Mansour this uh, peerage now, but perhaps there was some kind of quid pro quo already agreed beforehand in return for the £5 million, which is unprecedented from this particular donor to the Conservative Party. Mm. Um, but it, it, I think it, it is slightly tricky politics, given the Frank Hester has barely died down. Yeah, and therefore the, the Prime Minister still decided to go ahead with it, which yeah. maybe feels like he didn't read the room right. Or do you think the kind of... The fury over this is going to die down. Or the, perhaps the Tories are so desperate for money this year that mm -hmm. they'll just, you know, they're they'll throwing take everything at it. Hit. They'll still yeah. be throwing everything or, at or it. Or is it about Rishi Sunak's legacy? Is it because also the funding for the election, possibly, or he just thinks, I give up? Yeah, I mean... So I think most likely the Conservatives will lose at the next election, right? That's not breaking news. But the question is, how badly will they lose? Maybe an extra £5 million, £10 million will mean that it's a smaller loss than it would otherwise have been. You know, yeah. Going back to Nigel Farage, he was talking this week about the Canadian Conservative Party, which basically came from a third party position to oust the Progressive Conservative Party. And so he was mischievously saying that reform could basically oust the Conservatives as a second party. And if the Tories lose that many seats it is possible i mean it's unlikely mm -hmm. and so rishi sunak will be thinking how can we loss minimize right now yeah. and maybe that's what he's thinking when it comes to his legacy too cindy thank you so much cindy you assess assistant editor of the spectator really appreciate your time mm -hmm. there's lots to come here on the program as today marks exactly 10 years since the first gay marriage ceremonies in england and wales we're going to speak to one man celebrating his anniversary the time is 9 13 do stay with us Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. It's a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 9.16. Now, it's exactly 10 years since the first gay wedding took place in England after Parliament voted to allow same-sex marriages in 2013. But more than a decade since the legislation was introduced, gay couples are still unable to be married by the Church of England. Well, it's despite the organisation voting last year to allow clergy to bless the unions of same-sex couples who'd had civil weddings or partnerships. It's complicated. Yeah. Joining us in the studio is Peter McGrath. He's one half of the first gay couple to be married in England and Charlie Bell, a gay Anglican priest who hasn't been able to marry his partner as it's not allowed by the church. Um, good morning to both of you. Um, Peter, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Ten-year anniversary. Take us back to that day ten years ago. Uh, well, it was not unlike today, starting with lots of interviews. I was down at New Broadcasting House at 7am mm. and talking to the venerable John Humphreys and the type. Um, and the day continued like that, leading up to uh, a pre-wedding reception, I suppose, because the registrar wanted people inside, given that there had been massive um, protests in France when they brought in their law. Mm -hmm. So he was concerned about the possibility of security problems. And then married at midnight and then back out to meet the media scrum and uh. a, a more quiet, sophisticated, or, or at least relaxed uh, celebration at the Strangers Dining Room in the House of Commons the next day. How wonderful. Why was it important for you to be married as opposed to being in a civil partnership? Um, well, I, that's, that's an interesting question. We hadn't really thought about a civil partnership or, or marrying at all, I suppose. Um, We'd been together for 17 years before this legislation was in place. We had children before this legislation was in place. And my history goes back to those early days of the, as, as a campaigner, I mean, of the AIDS epidemic, when it became apparent that the lack of any uh, next of kin recognition mm -hmm. or partnership rights was resulting, and, and also at the time, the difficulty, extreme difficulty for gay men of getting a mortgage or life insurance. It meant that people, um, were not on mortgages or uh, tenancy agreements together. And then when bereaved in the middle of a stigmatised death, sometimes biological family would step mm -hmm. in 
uh, sees the house and the bereaved partner would be homeless and sometimes kept away from a funeral. So that was the genesis of it, I, for me anyway. Mm. And so it felt important as um, an LGBT activist to kind of seize that moment. We, we thought about, um, well, my partner had asked me actually to marry him before marriage was an offer. And I said, yes. Mm -hmm. And then we just didn't get round to it until Maria Miller announced the implementation mm -hmm. of this law. Charlie, thank you for joining us. It's a very busy mm. weekend. <laughs> yes, busiest, indeed. Uh, in your year. Great, yeah. Expe Ten years on, explain to us, uh, you're, you work under the umbrella of the Church of England. That's right. What are, what are the rules? Because the Church of England has been really looking at this and sort of wrestling with the idea about saying, should we allow blessings uh, of same-sex relationships? What's happening? Yeah, I mean, it's a mess. So it's, it's, it's kind of unforced error after unforced error in the Church of England on this topic. For, for people like me who are ordained, the, the rules remain really very strict, which is that we may not get married to someone of the same sex or gender and we may not, and we must remain celibate. And those, those remain the rules, despite the fact that Synod has said, this needs to change. Um, in terms of the, um, for, for people that come to us wanting Synod to get married... Synod is sort of the Church of England's, Synod's the Church of England's government, government body. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and, but in terms of um, uh, people coming to us wanting to get married, we still cannot give them a service whereby they turn up, we bless them, and they go on their way. We certainly can't marry them. That's actually illegal, according to English law. Um, but, we, but we can't even bless them in a, in a service all by itself at the moment. We can bless them, you know, as part of a Sunday day service um, in, in a kind of special set of prayers mm. that have been written. But we can't actually give them a service to remember for their friends and family to come before God uh, and to celebrate the wedding. So, so can I just ask you, if you're gay and you're a Christian, mm. how does that make you feel in terms of the fact the church is essentially turning their back on you? It's dire. It's dire because it's also not how many of us feel. So many priests, mm. I mean, I would say the majority of Anglicans and the majority of clergy would be in favour of blessing same-sex marriages and probably, frankly, going ahead and doing them um, rather than just blessing them. Um, but the church corporately, and as an institution still makes us feel like second-class at best citizens. We obviously don't have the voice here of the people in the Church of England mm. who would disagree with that. It raises questions, Charlie, about the, the future of the Church of England. If there is this sort of dissenting voice and this, this argument really that's broken out within the Church of England, does that mean it can't stay sort of united as a whole if something can't be agreed upon that is so sort of central about marriage? Yes and no. I, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure that marriage is central to the Christian faith, actually. It's not in the creeds. Um, there's no kind of definition of marriage in the Bible, for example. So there's no... It's, it's not as central as people make it out to be. Most of us actually want to live in a church where both of these positions can be held together with integrity. At the moment, we're struggling to do that. If we could find a place where we could have some Christians in the mm. Church of England, for example, saying, yes, we will do it, and some saying, no, we won't, I don't see that that would be a major problem. Uh, and, Peter, just going back to something you mentioned as well. I, I was a doctor working on the wards and I saw firsthand what happened when you had gay partners who were denied access to their loved ones because the law didn't entitle them, as you rightly say. Yeah. I mean, that was a shocking time. We've come a very long way. Would you like to see the church accept the way the rest of society has moved? Well, it seems that Justin Welby has a bit of a decision on his hands because obviously uh, with his rather sincere apology for not offering blessings that was given at the start of last year. Um, it seems like the, the pressure is on him not to be presiding over um, the Anglican communion falling apart. So, yeah, I'd obviously like to see people who are religious having the chance to marry within the established church. Uh, I have some problems with the idea that we have an established church and 26 bishops in the House of Lords, given that all of these things affect uh, such things as us having uh, state-funded faith schools, and then the children of gay men and lesbians, or young gay men and lesbians themselves, uh, or gay kids, are not getting the sex and relationship education they might have done had the best local school, and all local schools that are state-funded, mm. mm. uh, been available to them. We've only just sort of scratched the surface of this yeah. topic. Thank you both so much just thank for you. time. Peter, congratulations on yes. your anniversary. Yes, yeah, congratulations. Charlie, thank you <laughs> for joining not... us today on a very busy Easter weekend. Yes, um, very many congratulations. all we've got time for. Well, so Jeremy, so indeed, much. that's the end of uh, today's show. Jeremy and Rosie are back on Monday at 6 o'clock. No, I'm not going to be here on Monday. Nicola oh, will be Nicola here. Nicola will be. be Actually, I'll be here as well. But lots to come here. <laughs> Kev and Alex are next. Have a fantastic Easter weekend. First, though, let's get the weather with Isabel.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Not quite as bad as yesterday, but there will still be heavy showers and thunderstorms for the rest of today, particularly across more central and northern parts of the country. You can see how they develop, sort of blossom late morning and lunchtime and head their way northwards. There will be some sunshine in between and there's a good chance in the sunshine later in the day in the southeast that temperatures will reach 12 or maybe 13 degrees. Now, as we head through this evening and night, well, there'll still be some showers, but they will gradually fade for many inland areas. Still a few, though, for Scotland and also Northern Ireland. Where it is dry, and clearer for central and eastern parts though it'll turn a bit misty maybe some fog first thing tomorrow morning and it could well be a little bit chilly as well so quite a chilly start of the day saturday morning with temperatures in a few spots close to freezing but generally speaking i should think around three to five celsius and then as we head our way through saturday showers again but mainly this time across northern ireland and scotland to the south and west there could well be some showers popping up later in the day but otherwise a good deal of dry weather a good deal of sunshine as well thankfully and that'll help it feel just a little more pleasant out there a little more spring-like with highs of 13 to maybe 15 degrees Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale, and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has a 